a company or a country is in decline, you can try voice uh, or you can try exit. Voice is basically changing the system from within. Um, whereas Exit is leaving to create a new system. In 2013, the serial entrepreneur Balaji Srinivasan gave a widely discussed talk at the tech incubator Y Combinator on a paradigm derived from the work of the economist Albert O. Hirschman. There are two paths to reform, he explained, to speak up and remake a system from within, or to leave and build something new that might one day take its place. That latter concept of Exit is the framework through which Silicon Valley solves problems. And it captures the worldview of Srinivasan, who venture capitalist Mark Andreessen has said has the highest output per minute of new ideas of anybody I've ever met in my life. In his new book, The Network State, How to Start a New Country, Srinivasan makes the case for exiting today's nation states as they exist and migrating much, though not all, of our lives onto the internet. Ever-improving digital tools give humans an unprecedented and always accelerating ability to create opt-in, fully voluntary communities where people choose to meet, work, live, and love. From existing countries that are changing themselves by attracting immigrants with the promise of a better standard of living, to blockchain communities that draw participants by laying out clear-cut contractional rules, responsibilities, and obligations, Srinivasan articulates a future that is profoundly democratic and consensual, thus liberating us from a status quo in which self-determination is usually little more than a pipe dream. Srinivasan holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. He co-founded the genetic testing firm Council, and he served as the first chief technology officer of Coinbase, the popular cryptocurrency exchange. He's been a fierce critic over the years of the FDA, which might account for his being shortlisted to head up the agency under Donald Trump. What if this coronavirus is the pandemic that public health people have been warning about for years? He tweeted in January 2020, as Vox and mainstream outlets were busy attacking Silicon Valley venture capitalists for taking the crisis too seriously. It would accelerate many pre-existing trends, he wrote. Border closures, nationalism, social isolation, preppers, remote work, face masks, distrust in governments. Reason talked with Srinivasan about the network state the rise of China as a tightly centralized global power, why Peter Thiel is part of the descending class, and the future of freedom both online and off. Apology, thanks for talking to Reason. Good to be here. The book, the new book is, or the book is, The Network State. Uh, give me the elevator pitch, or given the kind of utopian dimension and reach of this, what's the space elevator pitch? Sure, the space the Well, I actually have something, uh, you know, if you go to the networkstate.com, yeah. uh, the full book is online and they actually have a, a one sentence, one image, mm -hmm. 1,000 word, a one thousand sentence. word version. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, the one sentence version is um, a network state is a highly aligned online community capable of collective action that crowdfunds territory and eventually attains diplomatic recognition. Right. And, uh, you know, it's just to take that definition, right? Highly aligned online community. That is not a signal group, a WhatsApp group, uh, a Facebook group, you know, a Twitter following, even, even a Discord is really not a highly aligned online community. Why? Because if you, if you have a million followers and you tweet a thousand likes, it might be a lot. And that's 0.1% conversion. Whereas if you're a CEO and you call in all hands, and you have 100 employees, you'll have on the order of 100 people attend. It'll, it'll be double digits at least, right? So that's not a 0.1% conversion rate. That's closer to 100%, certainly way more than 10%. Right. And so a highly aligned community is actually one that it has it is capable of doing things together, that's capable of collective action. It's also highly aligned in another sense, which is uh, it shares common values. The people on Facebook don't think of themselves as Facebookers. The people on Twitter don't think of themselves as Twitterians. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are people who hold Bitcoin who think of themselves as think of themselves as, as Bitcoiners, okay, right, uh, or Ethereum who think of themselves at the top of their identity stack is this, right? So highly aligned means that the online community that they belong to is at the top of their identity stack. They identify as that first, perhaps above the city or the country that they live in, okay. Right. So highly aligned online community, capable of collective action. As I mentioned, they can all do things together, mm -hmm. and the the very basic is if you put out a notification to a group of a thousand, all 1000 people should like a tweet. 
That's like a baseline. That's the simplest thing. That's yeah. one bit. But once you is start Bitcoin, is Bitcoin a fully realized network state yet no. for you? It, it's not, and it won't be. It, and the reason is it's just not. There's lots of things that are that have aspects of a network state mm -hmm. that are not what I'm calling a network state. And the reason is, you know, a currency is a part of a country, but it is not a country in its own right. You know, um, there's aspects of Facebook. Facebook certainly has large numbers of people. It shows you can achieve country scale on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not, people did not join Facebook with the concept that Zuck is their president, right? right. They did not sign a social smart contract going in. It has become a quasi-government in some ways, but that's like this uneasy hybrid transitional phase, as opposed to something where you go in eyes open and you literally sign, digitally sign a social smart contract. We can make that more than a metaphor. You know, we take the Rousseauian concept of the social contract and the crypto concept of the smart contract. We put those together. So just to, to you know, come back to your thing, the definition, highly aligned online community. So it's really got shared beliefs, top of the identity stack, capable of collective action. So it can do a thousand likes. That crowdfunds territory. So that's a much higher bar for collective action. That's not simply a thousand people liking something. That's thousand people who pool their funds and crowdfund territory, not necessarily in one place. There can be 10 people who get a group house and a hundred people who buy a cul-de-sac and, you know, 50 people who buy a ranch in different parts of the world. And then they're networked together and they think of themselves as part of the same community in the same way that somebody living in Hawaii or Guam, you know, or Alaska thinks of themselves as part of the United States despite living far away from the continental United States. In the same way, the people who live on the islands of Indonesia, they're separated by ocean. Well, what if you have islands that are separated by internet, but still think of themselves as part of the same country psychologically? Fundamentally, it is just about the, the software installed in people's heads. So how, look, important, how important is it that it, you know, that it exists online and also in meat space? I think Does it that, have to have both of those things? So I, I define the book various intermediate stages, and there's intermediate stages like a so-called network union, which is just a highly aligned community that does online things. And that can be useful, just like not every small business needs to become Google. There's lots of intermediate waypoints. You know, they can produce value for themselves or community in the middle. In the same way, uh, you, could, you could have a network union that's purely digital and it does collective action. Then the next step is what I call a network archipelago. And that is something that's crowdfunded these islands around the world, right? And the last step is a network state, which has achieved diplomatic recognition. And there is right. um, there's some measure of sovereignty that it has um, because one of the neighboring jurisdictions has said, okay, you can actually have the police or the military or the laws or the special economic zone or something like that over here on the island. Now, this is a part, by the way, people are sort of with me. They're like, okay, I can imagine you could increase the click rate from 0.1% to 50% or 100%. I can imagine you could even crowdfund territory. Obviously, Starbucks exists and they've mm -hmm. got properties all around the world. Google exists and you can swipe your Google badge and be in a piece of Google around the world. You know, things like WeWork real estate things exist and you can be, you know, part of these things around the world. Mm -hmm. Hotel chains exist, okay? So you have both things that are like commercial and like residential real estate around the world. Chinatowns exist, ethnic diasporas exist. So far, they're with me. The part that people get, you know, hung up on is they're like, okay, how do you go from that network archipelago to actually achieving diplomatic recognition and becoming a network state? Okay. So here I'll have to give several, you know, things to anchor this. First, do you know Tuvalu, like the .tv domain? Yes. Okay. So you have reason.tv actually, in fact, you might, you might right. actually have Okay. So Tuvalu did a deal with GoDaddy. That was a sovereign, mm -hmm. sovereign country that deal with the company. And they get only about, I mean, it's not that much money in the grand scheme of things like, 10 million something a year for Tuvalu with, for this deal, okay? Um, El Salvador has Bitcoin as its national currency. Wyoming has allowed Ethereum DAOs to be have legal status, okay? Um, Nevada did the deal with Tesla for the Giga factory. Amazon has done that HQ2 deal. Boeing did a deal with South Carolina and so on and so forth. There's actually quite a lot of deals between sovereigns, whether it's city, state, or country, mm -hmm. and between companies and now currencies, okay? And so the key question is, can we go to a digital country, to a crypto country that can negotiate in a similar way? And the reason right. I believe this is the case is, uh, do you know how many countries are in the UN? Uh, 180 something. It's like 190 know. something, depending on how you count, right? Yeah, okay. but it's, you're, you're yeah. close, right? So what fraction of those have less than 1 million people? Right. So yeah, actually, I mean, you have a great section in the book, and I forget the, you know, it's that most countries are small countries. Most countries are small countries, exactly. 
more than 50% of the UN is less than 10 million people. About 20% mm-hmm. is less than 1 million people. Um, about 5 to 10% is less than 100,000 people. You have these tiny places like Kiribati, you know, mm-hmm. came in. They, they, they have legal status. They're considered sovereigns. Um, you're crossing an international boundary. They are, quote, heads of state. They have flags. They might be even at the Olympics and so on and so forth. There is sort of this, what do you call it, a fiction or this uh, convention that all nation states are, quote, equal. And Kiribati, which is like, you know, 100,000 something people and China, which is a billion, are the same in a sense. And actually, a lot of multinational corporation stuff is based on this, on the basis of the fact that Cayman is a sovereign or BVI is a sovereign, British Virgin Islands, you know, um, Switzerland is a sovereign, even if it's much smaller than these other sovereigns. So these small countries, first, because most countries are small countries, you can build digital communities that are at or above that scale. We've, we've seen many of them. We've seen billion person mm-hmm. online networks, so only 10 million. Second, yeah. because they're small, you can negotiate with them. You can do deals, as I've just shown, with Tuvalu and other places. Third, it's relatively small amounts of money. So like 10 million a year is enough to get a .TV deal. What is the deal? How much money is necessary? It's not just money, of course. I'll come to something else in a second. But how much money would be required to, say, buy an island in the island country kind of chain and Mm -hmm. have a special economic zone there where it's like an uninhabited island or it's a patch of desert. Nevada's trying this also with its private cities laws. It's got lots of patches of desert. No one's doing anything with them. You know, there's some kind of deal that works where you're generating revenue, tax revenue, subscription revenue, whatever you want to call it for the rest of your citizens. And you're effectively either selling or seeding some portion of, of land, just like the Louisiana Purchase, just like, you know, quote Seward's folly where, you know, Russia sold, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the territory. It's not always a folly. Sometimes it's a smart thing. I mean, France was right. smart to actually do the Louisiana Purchase. And now you've got some measure of sovereignty. It's not all the way, right? You're not saying that, you know, uh, you, you, you're a nuclear weapon state and all this type of stuff. Mm-hmm. But maybe you could have a self-driving car zone, right? Maybe you could have stem cells. Maybe it's something like that. You have one regulation that you can actually change, and that's huge. What is the, what's the impetus for a network state? Or, or I guess let me let me uh, go back a little bit. Um, your your thought in general, uh, and certainly the book is uh, deeply indebted to the uh, uh, late '90s book, The Sovereign Individual: Mastering the Transition to the Information Age, which was by James Dale Davidson and William Rees Mogg. And they kind of prophesied, or th- or they were talking about the end of the nation state as we knew it, um, you know, and that things were shifting, power uh, and agency was shifting to smaller units than the nation state. And this is, <clears throat> you know, a very powerful uh, kind of exuberant, although not without warnings, but, uh, you know, kind of end of history track where the Cold War is over and we don't need the we don't need the same scale of social organization that had been provided by nation states, particularly in a kind of state of uh, of low energy war and whatnot. Um, your book is indebted to that. Can you talk a little bit about where you know how how that influences your thinking, and then what you're building on? Because sure. I want to get to the question of like why you know why do why do we need this? Uh, sure, why do sure. we need the network state totally. when all of this stuff you're talking about is already kind of taking place? Right. So uh, I certainly, I think the sovereign individual is an important book. I think it's an influence. Yeah. Um, but I would actually say that, you know, if there's uh, a, a more important inspiration, not the only inspiration mm-hmm. also, but a more important one, it's actually a book in 1897, a hundred years before the sovereign individual. That is Der Judenstaat by Theodor Herzl, which translates mm-hmm. as the Jewish state. And that was the sure. book that led to the formation of Israel. And, he was a guy who, you know, saw the events of his time and he was like, you know, do, do the Jewish people, do they assimilate or, you know, some people, you know, think communism is a good thing that, that turned out to not be a good thing. And he's like, what if we take a third path and we actually create a state of our own? Okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm generally, you know, pro-Israel, but I also recognize there's lots of controversies there. Backing into all of that, the main thing is that um, he wrote a book. Everybody thought he was crazy. He yeah. organized a conference. He helped, uh, or some, there, there was a there was a fund that got started up, and then over fifty years, you eventually literally got a state of Israel. And in fact, part of how it started was they crowdfunded territory there. They got some measure of sovereignty from the Brits. And it was a gradual process over years, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that's one inspiration. Another inspiration is India with its um, mm-hmm. nonviolent independence movement. Okay. Another inspiration is Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew with um, you know the the CEO founder of this city state. And of course, America's inspiration and 
too many ways to name from the Constitution and common law and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. And frankly, the the true aspect of democracy, which is consensual government, right? The right. consent of the government is what democracy really is at root. And a big part mm-hmm. of the network state is not about, it's about 100% democracy, not 51% democracy. Right. That is to say, everybody who's in a network state has agreed to be there and can agree to leave. And you have consensus right. as opposed to a 51% democracy where 51% outputs the 49% beats them up, takes their cornflakes. And then, you know, maybe 2% and could even, year. and could even say, and you can't leave and you can't leave. Exactly. Right. So yeah. once one, uh, the other ghost kind of floating around here, I think, you know, is Albert Hirschman and his concept voice and exit, exit yeah. voice and loyalty. loyalty. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So um, go ahead. There's, there's, uh, well, yeah, just uh, continue with that idea of like 100% democracy versus 51%. Right. So a 51% democracy, that is something where it's raw, bare majoritarianism. It is the minimum amount of democracy where, yeah, it's the quote, consent of the governed, but it's only the mm-hmm. consent of 51%. 51% democracy is 49% dictatorship. Right. That 49% did not get, did not want the current leader that they have, right? And they are subject to something that they did not vote for. Moreover, there's many other implementation details or really serious ones. For example, when you vote for somebody, their campaign promises are not binding. So you can vote for them and they can decide to do something completely different. Um, or, you know, th- there's uh, you know, there's issues where, uh, you know, were the Iraqis enfranchised? I don't really think so. 30 million people are you know, invaded and they didn't have a vote or say in that. Right? There's many, many aspects of the current system where folks don't really practically have a say or are right. outset. And so you have the very barest level of justification for it. And instead of something like that, nor and also against, by the way, the other extreme would be to reject the idea that the, the, the government have any consent at all and just impose raw authoritarianism. That's like the CCP model. I think right. a, a V3, a third version, a different version is to say, Consent. Consent first, mm-hmm. consent at the highest level. And you can even consent to, um, you know, like a commitment device. You might consent to something. And so long as you go and open eyed, you say, OK, uh, I'm joining, let's say, this digital Sabbath community. And they turn off the Internet at 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. every day. Why? Because while I'm lucid, I have self-control. But I know at some points I'll surf the Internet too much. So I want to join the society that gives me some health and mm-hmm. self-control. So you can sort of consent to give up some sovereignty. Just as when you join a company, you give up some sovereignty, you're now reporting to a manager or what have you, in return for something that benefits both parties, right? You join the military, you're a private in the military, you're obeying a general, both of you, you know, are, are doing that to win a war or whatever, but you've given up some sovereignty in return for potentially something greater. And so that's why I, I like The Sovereign Individual. I think it's an important book, but I also think that, you know, really what I think we're going to have is The Sovereign Collective, okay? Okay where it is a group of folks that self-determine together. And the thing is that, uh, you know, what, what the Sovereign Individual is a very far-sighted book, and it foresaw the decentralization. But what has happened is you've got the counter-decentralization. You have the U.S. establishment and the CCP are trying to mash this genie back in the bottle with deplatforming, with censorship, with surveillance, with unbanking, with all this stuff. In my view, the Chinese will succeed in the counter-decentralization, and the U.S. establishment will fail. And, but it won't fail in an easily resolved fashion. You'll just have this period of American anarchy where no faction, no one faction has enough strength. In that kind of environment, historically, this is why, I would, you know, there's aspects of libertarian thought I'm certainly sympathetic to, but right. I never call myself a libertarian because I consider myself a pragmatist. You know, in, in, for example, in Chinese history, they have this saying, the empire long united must divide, long divided must unite. Right. That's a cycle of centralization, decentralization. Right. And then, you know, the most unpopular but important word in the world. Recentralization. Mm-hmm. OK, recentralization is an unpopular word. Why? Those who are the fans of centralized power, let's say the U.S. establishment or CCP, are saying, why do you recentralize? We're, we're the good guys. We're already there. Right. Right. Those are, who are, let's call them anarchists or just, you know, maximalist decentralists would say, why would you recentralize? The whole point is to break away from this right. you know, thing over here, right? But the thing is that when you have, uh, let's say a fire alarm rings and everybody runs out of the building, there's a gathering spot for them to meet up again, you know? Because everybody on their own, totally on their own, it's actually pretty hard to totally fend for oneself. I don't know if you saw that Steve Jobs email that just came out where he said, 
you know, he doesn't grow his own food and he doesn't, mm -hmm. do you know what I'm talking about, right? And, yeah. you know, this is something where not in the, you didn't build that way, right? But more right. in the enlightened self-interest way. We are. Right. I mean, this is division of labor. Division. You recognize even Steve Jobs, maybe he would have been the greatest thing. You know, he would have been the greatest farmer and this and that, but it doesn't make sense for him. That's exactly right. And you can't do everything in one life, right? Now, yes, AI, robotics, this does expand right. the scope of what can be done. The, the internet teams are becoming smaller. We having, yeah. We're having a correction, but that correction isn't going from a billion to like zero people. It's going to smaller groups, but not zero or one right. person, right? So can I ask just as, uh, you know, and, and you talk about this, uh, that the book is a toolbox, not a manifesto. Yes. So in a way you're taking for granted on a profound level that the status quo, uh, and I, I don't know, maybe we want to say it's the status quo of the past 50 years or whatever, uh, including the nation state, that the nation state, um, if that was people's primary identity for a good chunk of the 20th century, is no longer really delivering the goods um, in terms of people want to swear loyalty first above all other things to America or to China, perhaps, or to India or to wherever. So they're looking for, um, you know, other identities that become primary to them or sources of value. Can you talk a little bit about what went into the breakdown of the status quo that led to this, you know, the, the sure. original moment of decentralization? And at various points, you could talk about it as unbundling and, and we're going through a period of rebundling. Yeah. But yeah, so, what what happened that you know what's the what's the 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 pretext for where we're like okay we need something more in our lives what what, what was, was working, working 20 years ago or 50 years ago doesn't seem to be totally, delivering to us totally so one thing i'll say is i don't actually think all nation states will fail but i do think mm -hmm. something new will arise a, a rough analogy might be the reformation you know protestantism arose there's a counter reformation of catholicism but yeah. both Protestantism and Catholicism are both still around today, right? right? You have this force and you have the counter force and they're both still around. And they fought and allied and whatever at various mm -hmm. points over history, right? Um, and in kind of the same way, um, I think some states will manage to make it through what we've got, but I think many mm -hmm. won't. Uh, and why is that, right? You can start the modern period at, you know, depending on how you start, 1648, mm -hmm. Peace of Westphalia, after the Thirty Years' War, triggered, by the way, by the printing press in part, because mm -hmm. you have the Reformation, okay, wars right. of religion. And at the end of this long, bloody war where people were fighting over whether silly things like, or in, in theory, silly things like whether... <laughs> to you, because you're not a believer in I many know. ways. I know, yeah. at the time, yeah. but basically whether, you know, uh, the wafer was actually the body of Christ, this was like right. a huge deal. Right. But yeah, and yeah. I, didn't, I didn't understand at the time, now I understand it more, because... That was a religious thing, but it's also a political thing because who is going to be in power? That's where fire right. is. The church going to be in power, yeah. power, or are these new guys going to be in power, and so on. Like so you know, the 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 war, the coming war between proof of work and proof of stake may <laughs> be almost as bloody, and it's almost as symbolic. But so crypto in fast forward has, I mean, people don't yet understand this, but the Bitcoin wiper it is like the Bible or the Quran or the communist mm -hmm. manifest. It, it is something which is such a powerful document that it's giving rise to splits and splits and splits yeah. and splits and so on. It's not just a document, of course, it's a code base and, and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the the modern era, like lots of things we think of as constants, as flat, are becoming variables, okay? Let me give some examples. Uh, it used to be just currency, and now it's cryptocurrency or fiat currency. It used right. to be a meeting, and now it's is it in-person or remote, okay? It used to be that 77% of Americans went to church, almost flat for many years. And now it's just collapsed to like 47% going to church, synagogue, et cetera, according to people. Right, and, but, and declining. And declining, yeah. that's right. Um, there's many other things, if you think about it, that were constants that are now variables. Mm -hmm. One of the most important is that the Westphalian assumption was that people who lived near each other geographically shared culture and therefore could agree on the same laws. This seemed obvious. Obviously, you know, someone who you live next door to, you're going to be talking to them. You're going to probably be going to the same store and so on and so forth. Not anymore. Now, you are using Snapchat. You're using, you know, Facebook. using 
Signal, whatever, all these messaging apps, social networks, you're connecting with people 3,000 miles away. You're sharing intimate mm-hmm. moments with them. They're, they're your friends. You're shopping online. And you don't even recognize your next door neighbor. If you're in an urban environment, there's an apartment complex with all closed doors. You would not even recognize the human being many times who's living 50 feet, 100 feet away from you, right? right. The person living 50 feet above, 50 feet below, okay? That is actually, in my view, an unnatural state of affairs that will not persist indefinitely. And the reason being because um, it's, it's not useful space around you. Uh, you know, one way to think about it is in a computer, you set it up so you've got like the CP, CPU and you've got a cache and you've got like, you know, L2 cache and you have RAM and then you have the hard drive and then you have the internet. And you split up computations in such a way that things that are very frequently accessed are close in memory space. And you only hit the internet for really, you know, things where you can tolerate that huge lag of, you know, round trip to the Netherlands and back or whatever. Okay. And right now your life is set up in such a way that much of the space, especially if you're in an in a, in a urban environment around you, is not useful space. You don't know those people, right? You you can't knock on their door for you know the proverbial cup of sugar. You, they can't help babysit for you or something like that. You don't know people around you, okay? And that's an unnatural way to live where your true community is in the cloud and not the land, okay? So recognizing first that that current geographical community no longer reflects your true neighbors of mind, but also recognizing that people are physical beings and want those kind of walkable communities, for example, you know, college, people like it. Why? At least they used to like it um, because it was a selective environment where not everybody got accepted, only those people with, you know, shared values, et cetera. And then you had this sort of walkable campus where, if you recall, college around the time, perhaps you or I went to college, it was an open door policy. People could walk around and so on and so forth. That's actually why people have great memories of college. Um, at least in the 90s, the, Although the 2000s. that is a, a very specific, I mean, that's a four-year residential college. True, which true. Which is not necessarily even what most people experience. I, I mean, I guess what I want to challenge with you, because I, I think I'm about to accuse you of misreading your book, is that we want different types of communities, and Absolutely. we want to be able to access them simultaneously. And so I mean, I, I moved to New York after years away because I could and because I wanted the physical uh, proximity to people who are doing similar things to me. But like, I don't, you know, I don't want to have to get all of my food from, uh, you know, Manhattan or, or oh. Brooklyn or a day away in New Jersey. Um, my thought processes, I don't want all of my TV, you know, like I can pipe in I'm, I'm living as are you obviously in like multiple different totally. communities all the time. And the physical space does matter. I mean, when you say it's dead space, I'm not sure. I like my little neighborhood. Here. Sure. Sure. But I, I don't want it to be my entire world. I understand. And the way I think about it is, um, of course, you know, to your point, I do believe in many different kinds of communities that make different trade-offs yeah. on these axes. Right. Absolutely. Right. do believe in that. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that I think if you had, for example, a building where it was, I don't know, Reason and Cato and Tech Founders and YCP, like essentially yeah. your community all lived in one building or one town, that'd be a pretty awesome town, right? It didn't. Ha- it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. a college. I'm just using the yeah. example of a college because... But this, I mean, it could be Silicon Valley. It could be Silicon Valley. That's right. But basically, right. Um, even Silicon Valley is a little spread out, right? Right. The, the advantage yeah. of having folks within walking distance is you just have serendipity. You have, you know, mm-hmm. something where, you know, uh, as I said, like babysitting or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when during yeah. COVID, these home pods and stuff like that, people are within walking distance or like a short drive or something like that. It's just easier to have informal bonds, right? And right. Uh, so, so people want that, but, uh, you know, there's kind of, you know, a few different ways to think about it. Some folks... Um, think that you can kind of go back to exactly the 1950s, that's very difficult to do to wind back the clock, but you can wind it all the way around. And what I mean by that is you could get all the people who think they want this and just go and crowdfund territory in Nevada or, or someplace right. like that, right? If there's a there's an app called CoStar. It's a real estate search engine. It's a little bit expensive, but you can literally use that to search the properties of the world and you can yeah. find some spot. You can all go and live together. And ta-da, right. you can live that existence. And the internet allows you to filter that and find that and go and build that and execute on it. 
And so it's not just a LARP online. You might you might have to figure out, okay, well, what exactly do people want? Do they actually want the trad life? Right. Do they want some, you know, unarticulated hybrid where there's a different threshold for each person? Turning it from sort of this gauzy fantasy into an actual reality, you have to make pragmatic decisions. There's a difference between the idea and the execution. There's a thousand micro decisions you have to make when you're executing something. Some of them not obvious when it's just an idea. And so that's what I encourage is people have some vision of the good. You know, you'll also find, for example, quite a few like Brooklyn media types have this sort of fantasy of going to the farm and giving up the capitalist rat race and just milking the yeah, cows yeah. or something like that. Right now, it is certainly possible to live like this. Their ancestors did. It is also actually a much lower standard of living in many ways. And it's not easy to, to yeah. run a farm, right? Uh, you're, you're talking to somebody whose grandparents moved to the city after a thousand years in, you know, in the, in the countryside, in right. Ireland and Italy. And like, I think it's going to be a thousand years before my ancestors go back or descendants go back to the farm. Sure. And obviously a version of this happened. Uh, you know, in the 60s, say, like if you look, you know, the, the kind of whole earth catalog vision of going back to the land, but with better technology and things like that. And that is, I mean, part of what you're talking about is that all of this is enabled both by the Internet as well as by uh, kind of human action. Right. We, we are now in a place where we can more fully envision and build the communities that we say that we want. We can run those experiments. That's right. So, so basically, I think the decentralization and recentralization mm-hmm. that the internet allows, it's the unbundling and rebundling, right. um, that will mean that you probably have some one or more communities where you can find your place. Okay. Right. And just like you have to choose, you know, as you choose your job, you, you, you might be interested in both space travel and you're interested in, you know, I don't know, search or something like that you're choosing between SpaceX or Google, like in the same way you choose a community that fits your values. And then conversely, they choose you. There's an application process. Um, Mm -hmm. This is the difference between the early 2000s. Like in the early 2000s, the goal was to get everybody online. I think in the Mm -hmm. 2020s, the goal is to get everybody aligned. Right. Okay. Meaning that's right. Right. So what that means is just within a community, you have to agree on just absolutely basic premises. Like, yeah. Just private property exists. Okay. Like right. you have to agree on those basic premises before you have, you have conclusions from there. Endless disputation right. over basic premises doesn't work. Uh, right. So instead you recruit those folks and you know, here's the thing I can believe that there are, for example, a vegan village or a carnivory community. I think those could both be positive deviations from the, you know, McDonald's America. Right. Yeah. Basically, both of those could be positive, even if they're mutually incompatible. Right. Right. So what what is the uh, what's the underlying operating system? Uh, because, you know, in, in a way, what you're what I think you're talking about or the way that I tend to interpret and kind of translate into what I already know of what you're talking about is this is kind of what liberal, you know, liberal classical liberal politics are this where it, it is a backdrop. You know, it's it's kind of like a coral reef or a structure that is designed to say we recognize that different people have different d- desires and we want to create a system where as many people can do what they want to do in groups or individually, as long as they're not fucking up other people, you know, they're not using coercion. And as long as what they're doing doesn't completely crash the system, uh, what is you know, what are the core values besides um, consent, which is a huge one. Right. Um, you know, that's one of the values, but then what is the technology or, you know, what, what are, what are the bits that go into the operating system that will allow all of the different experiments you see taking place? Sure. So, um, you know, in many ways it pulls from different areas on the political spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, you know, uh, libertarians think about new countries, but libertarians don't usually get the concept of diplomatic recognition. A lot of them were very surprised yeah. that I made a big deal of that in the book. Because they're like, why can't we just do it ourselves, like Liberland or Sea Land, right? I'm right. like, well, you know, you and what army, right? The, right. the whole point of yeah. like the reason a country works is that there's enough other people that recognize it mutually. There's there's this whole web mm-hmm. of things which are um, fundamentally diplomatic recognition is like a non-binding commitment to not invade. 
Right. You know, the reason I say it's called non-binding is yeah, yeah. the U.S. might invade anybody at once, but at least it's an international incident if it does, right? Russia might invade right. anybody at once, right? But it's an international yeah. incident when they cross sovereign boundaries. But if they, right. if the British Navy were to go and scoop up sea land or something like that, everyone would laugh. No one would care. No one recognizes it right. as an actual country, right? Yeah. So, and Liberland, it depends on the tide and the river, right? Like maybe it's there, maybe it's I, there. I have nothing against. I, I think some of the people of Liberland, like I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic. Oh, I love them. I yeah. think they're. I think it's great. But what you're saying is, is that, and, and they're they are actually working for sure. Um, you know, diplomatic recognition. Yes. Yeah, so, so the thing is, that's as important. The crypto country, mm-hmm. fiat country bridge, is as important as the cryptocurrency fiat currency exchange. In fact, it's the yeah. same thing, right? Just like we have a relationship, a complicated one, between your fiat currency and your cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Where, where should I start again? What was the word? Uh, but there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of sirens right here. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's Loads DC. Fire. It's on fire. I mean, it's Rome in like you know four four hundred AD. It really is. It's just burning to talk about, down. Just to talk about this for a second, like this is a big realization. I mean. Coming to the U.S. is the first time being here for two and a half years, right? Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and my observation is, I can wait. I'm sorry, you said are you coming to D.C.? You mean not to the U.S. To the U.S. To the U.S. The first time oh. being the U.S. Since oh, where were you? Were out of the country for two and a Singapore. half years? Singapore. I moved to Singapore okay. a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is the first time being in the U.S. since like February 2020, actually, since I talked to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I've been remote, whatever. I mean, that's the thing is no one even knows yeah. or cares really because, you know, right. in the cloud, yeah, right? Yeah. So, but um, the the thing is that what I noticed is something I predicted, but I can also see, A, why people are in denial about it, but B, why I think I'm also right, which is uh, San Francisco-ization of much of, you know, what's called blue America, right? Mm-hmm. The, you know, like the zombified people in... New York and in DC kind of walking around like there's a person who's like screaming out of their mind like outside like the dinner yesterday it reminded me of it was like uh-huh. okay you know this is reminds me of San Francisco in the early 2010s and so it's it's not going to be a stable polity in my view right like something like that just the incipient signs are there on their hand there's something that's come out of I mean, it's funny you know people say California is the future of America and it is San Francisco the San Francisco model is being exported to Seattle and to mm-hmm. LA and to uh, New York and to D.C. And, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, that's bad uh, because it's something which net-net, the way you score a city is are people going there or are they leaving, right? right? Net-net, all of the decisions which you can score as liberal or progressive or libertarian or what have you, there's a complex of decisions and net-net, do you produce something that people want to move to or not, right? Mm-hmm. And these blue cities are not producing that anymore. They're actually losing people to both red cities and to the rest of the world. That's a new thing, actually. That's kind of a flippening, I think, really post-2020 that it's really accelerated on that. Have you been to any um, growing cities in the United States? So like yeah, have you been so to places like Miami, Miami or Austin or whatever? Yeah, yeah and I have. Do you, do you see them as, uh, you know, are they, are they going to grow in the long term or is this merely they're, they're getting people who are just fleeing, it's, you know, um, bad parts of America who will end up going elsewhere it's hard to say but i am tentatively bullish on them uh however it's something where um i think what i'm interested in is the subnational and the international Mm -hmm. meaning the subnational is wyoming and texas and miami and actually colorado Mm -hmm. jared police a democrat there but it's very pro crypto right um and uh, I'm also bullish on the international, you know, mm-hmm. UAE, Thailand, Singapore, a lot of these countries are now implementing programs for talented immigration. And in fact, um, the US, uh, there's, a, there's a graph, uh, I think BCG put together a graph on this, but the US is no longer the top destination uh, that immigrants want to come to. It's actually mm-hmm. Canada's number one. And then what's risen into the top 10 overnight is Japan, Australia, Singapore, and New Zealand. And Mm -hmm. a lot of European countries have fallen out of the top 10. And part of the reason I would argue for that is that most of the world economy is in Asia. And these are sort of uh, Western friendly countries in Asian time zones or in Asia itself, Japan's Asia proper, where you can do business and so on, right? 
Is so, that also because they are making immigration easier? I mean, the United yes. States has a terrible immigration policy, both for you know low skilled workers, but also high skilled yes. workers. Canada makes it easier, and and I because this goes to the question of Singapore um, is kind of a great place to live, especially if you're a high wage or a high skilled immigrant. Um, but if you are at all a kind of social deviant. Um, and you don't have cultural or political capital there, maybe you don't want to live there. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it, U.S. immigration policy is anarcho-tyrannical. It's actually like San Francisco. You know, San Francisco, um, San Francisco is optimized for the drug trafficker. American immigration policy is optimized for the human trafficker. Ha ha. Okay. So <laughs> what I mean by that is like, uh, you know, in San Francisco, you have something where um, the working class guy who's driving an Uber is hit with a two hundred dollar ticket, but the guy who like smashes the window, nothing happens to him, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's the tyranny and the anarchy. And American immigration policy is like that, where uh, you have kind of a lawless situation where um, you know you, you have like these scenes at the border and so on, but you also have something where those folks who obey the law are hit with insane levels of regulations, ten year delays on visas, yeah. and so on and so forth, right? And uh, you know, I, I do actually believe in a skilled, talented, organized immigration policy, which um, it, it's kind of like a company, right? If, you, if you're if you hiring, the, the right answer is usually not hire no one or hire everyone. It is hire in a conscious and determined and forthright and intelligent way, right? That is actually what these other countries that I mentioned do. They're looking for uh, wealth, but they're also looking for talent, you know, mm-hmm. not just the people who've made their fortune, but who are high potential. Maybe they're in the arts or stuff like that. So you, this may not have made the news or may not have seen this, but for example, Thailand now has a new program where you can apply online at, at Thailand's uh, website. And um, they're looking for a million people over the next five years to come and move to Thailand. They basically, at first, they were a lot of digital nomads went to Thailand and the Thai government was like mad at them. But now they've leaned into it and they're like, you know right. what? We've got these amazing beaches. We've got, you know, this uh, amazing internet now. It's massively undervalued globally. A lot of people want to come here. Guess what? We're going to do a 10 year pass. You have to fill out this rigorous application. We want a million people over the next five years. That's 200,000 people a year. That's on the order of a thousand ish, 500 to a thousand ish people a day. Okay. Which means they'll get, you know, 10 X more than that probably in applications. Okay. So they are going to be able to pull in a lot of folks who could not come to the U S because the visa delays or crazy things that are happening. Right. Or don't want to come to the U S. Right. And, uh, you know, the UAE has programs like this. Singapore has something new called the One Pass. And then within the U.S., you have Miami and Austin and so on competing. So this, this sort of thing where all the talent and so on came to SF, mm-hmm. and that is now suddenly inverted, where it's redistributing within the U.S. and outside the U.S. People are not only leaving, mm-hmm. they're not coming in the first place, they're picking other destinations. And I think this is net good. And the reason is, look, I mean, San Francisco is a catastrophe. But the decentralization of tech around the world is a good thing because right. you don't want it all concentrated in one place, in one state, in one country, which yeah. is vulnerable to regulations. And, you know, people yeah, you want a more so. resilient network. And, yes. you know, it's good for the planet, right? It's good for human civilization. It yes. may not be great for the United States. Um, and, or of course, the United States. Yeah. And the United States, of course, can change its immigration policy. We've right. defaulted into. Uh, you know, just a horrible kind of semi-closed borders it's, uh, situation. It's which, a worst of both worlds policy, right? Yeah. In my view. Go ahead. Um, so let me, uh, you know, let me ask you, though, then, like, what about China? Because China is a place, and you, you in the book, it's interesting because you talk about China a lot, obviously the United States, and you also talk about India, and I want to get to that sure. in a second. But where, what does China do? Because they are, as you were right. saying, you know, they are the... You know, they're the last bastion, or, or rather the leading indicator of right. kind of centralization in a very strict way. There are people, and you mentioned in footnotes, Peter, like Peter Nehas, who, who believe that, you know, China's awesomeness or fearsomeness is, is overrated. Right. You tend to take China as a, you know, as a type of non, it's not a network state, it is very much a physical polity that has centralized control and is maintaining borders and might be expanding borders uh, conceivably as very successful. What are they doing that allows them in your mind to continue to centralize in an age where it seems like 
decentralization and certainly voluntary, mm-hmm. um, you know, interaction and consent is kind of the the currency of the future. But China is not any of that, is it? Right. So China is, you, you know, how in the U.S. In the U.S. in the 20th century was the exception to many rules. It was large and religious and capitalist and, and so on. Right. You know, it was. It was the mm-hmm. big country that was outside of the European wars. You know, it was the exception to many rules. You had a bunch of countries, then you had the U.S. as an exception, right? Right. That's China, I think, in this in this century. Um, it is, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I think the counter, you know, there's the decentralization of the Internet. There's the counter decentralization of the U.S. establishment mm-hmm. and the CCP. And I think the counter decentralization wins in China. I think it loses in America. Why does it win in China? Because they took the hit early on to implement the Great Firewall. They banned social media, foreign social media, and they built their own. The thing is that um, there's a certain kind of like, uh, this is not to say that China is omnipotent or they get everything right or, or so, so And, and you're, you're not saying morally this is yeah. a preferable scheme or anything. That's right, that's right. But yeah. they are, um, there are things that they execute well on. Recently, they've been doing really dumb things, which is like infinite COVID lockdowns. Mm -hmm. It is possible, you know, the thing is, I think 90%, that's probably a bad idea. I think I remember in the late 2000s, I thought their banning of foreign social media was the dumbest thing. It turned out to actually have a logic to it where now they have root control over everything there. They cannot be Mm -hmm. deplatformed by Silicon Valley. They have sign away bow. They have a whole homegrown ecosystem where they have total root control over everything. You know, yep. you know what I mean by root? Like, a, yes. you're, you're, you're like a guest user system. Sure. China has yes. root over everything. That's why China, some people compare China to like Japan in the 80s and say, oh, the U.S. was scared by Japan. They, they, you know, they shouldn't be concerned about China. They're totally different because Japan is a U.S. protectorate, right? Mm-hmm. Japan is ultimately under the aegis of the U.S. military. Um, and there are various things that the U.S. could sort of force Japan to do, like, you know, build plants in the U.S. and buy treasuries, mm-hmm. but not buy companies. Michael Hudson, who's like a heterodox Marxist, writes about some of this. I, I don't speak Japanese, so I haven't like poked around. But mm-hmm. my strong hunch, and somebody maybe watching this can do the forensics, is that there were various levers that the U.S. essentially used its root access to sort of keep Japan down or whatever. And why is that plausible? Well, the U.S. is certainly trying to stop China from exceeding it now. Think about all the sanctions and other things that are happening, right? And um, But China has root. It's a different thing. Mm-hmm. They have root over their entire country. They also have a vast domestic economy that they can, I mean, they can yeah. just spend I mean, filling in for a century and they're yeah. going to be, they He's, don't need the, the rest of the, I mean, they everybody needs trade, but they're they like more, the United States in the 19th century. This, they have a lot of room to grow internally. This is why, I, I mean, I have no I don't know beef with him, but this is why I disagree with, I don't know, about 70, 80% of what Zihan, Peter Zihan says, because Look, I mean, the U.S. is picking a fight with its factory. Okay. Right. Like, net, net, China makes a lot of stuff. They have giant mm-hmm. factories. They make drones. Um, you know, for example, some some premises like, oh, the U.S. Navy is super powerful. It's got all these aircraft carriers and China's weak. You know, I saw a stat that China has uh, 23 million, you know, tons of uh, ships built a year, and the U.S. has something like 200,000. This is about like a 100x difference. That's the same kind of thing. That's pl- whether that's true or not. That's plausible. Looking at the construction, looking at mm-hmm. other kinds of things. You saw the gate stat from a few years ago that China poured more concrete in a few years than the U.S. had in the entire 20th century. They can and do build in the physical world. They ship to every country in the world. They are they are good in the physical world. We, you have to just mm-hmm. acknowledge reality on that. The U.S., however, is I think where the U.S. strength is is not actually where people think it is. Um, I think the U.S. is almost becoming like desiccated in the physical world. For example, the $300 million bus lane that took 20 years in San Francisco. Right. What that is going to become is the $300, the, the, the $3 billion bus lane that takes 100 years. Mm-hmm. Like it's not improving. OK, right. it's been getting worse since 2010. In 2010, Teal observed that we couldn't innovate. In 2020, we find it very expensive to simply maintain, you know, and this is New York subways. This is, you know, power outages in California. This is the water in Jackson. Like you're starting to see basic infrastructures type stuff in the U.S. like not work because how many people do you know who talk about civil engineering all day? Right. Right. It's simply, I mean, how many folks. It is a community that I voluntarily choose not to engage. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Sure. 
So, but the thing is that basically the yeah. talent has not been going into physical world infrastructure in part right. because A, it's just assumed to work. B, it's something which is very difficult to innovate on or do anything new on mm-hmm. or make a profit on or what have you. Okay. And hence the brain power that might be going into that is going to search or going to yes. you know, various kinds of you know software design and things that, like that. That's right. So what the US is, if it is anything, is a digital power. It's a cloud mm-hmm. power. And actually, I yep. tweet about this, and here's a contrarian or interesting thing. And I, I'm not saying I fully embrace this view, but let me just float it. This is new. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I was just thinking about this. So historians, um, you know, they talk about the division between like land powers and sea powers, like uh, you know, telocracy and a telerocracy and a thalassocracy, like a land and a sea empire. And a land empire would be like, you know, historically Germany or like right. Russia, right? To some extent, China. Okay, giant swaths of land. Whereas a sea power is like Japan or like Britain, right? Great Britain. Right. And the sea power is the navy and the land power is the army, right? The sea power is commerce and trade and so on. And the land power is conquest. Not that the sea power doesn't, you know, get its hands dirty at times. It certainly does. But it's more like wily and clever and agile and so on. Whereas the land Mm -hmm. power is sort of straightforward. And it's distributed. It's distributed. It's distributed. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's right. So it's decentralized versus centralized and so on. And uh, the thing is that um, the new version of the sea power may be the cloud power. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the, the term port, you know, it's funny, just a play on words, but yeah, yeah. There's, there's a right. port in every harbor, but there's also a port, a on, port every on every device. computer and on every site. Yeah. Exactly. That port yeah. is how you connect on the internet, right? right. It's an interesting term, which actually does have something there about it, which is how could Portugal, for example, get to Brazil? It didn't have to go over land yeah. through all these places. It right. had a peer-to-peer connection to Brazil. The oceans were the original internet mm-hmm. in that sense. You could send goods and packages, right. just put something on there, you push it, it floats, right? And uh, so Portugal could connect to Brazil, it could connect to Macau, it could run this mm-hmm. network where the ocean was this sort of demilitarized right. zone and they could connect things. Now, a cloud power is uh, and one other thing, by the way, about the sea powers is often they were they arose on islands like Britain or Japan. They just right. obligate. They had to learn how to fish. Yeah. That's why, you know, a lot of Japanese cuisine is sushi. It's like fish, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, Britain is all about the navy. That was like a big thing for mm-hmm. them, right? Trade, maritime stuff. So, the um, the the sea powers often their home islands are only so so. And sort of by necessity, they need to learn to kind of go abroad and to trade and to, to do these things, okay? And you can say this to a greater or lesser extent for different sea powers, but this is, I think, being true. And so in a sense, this is the super contrarian, and it's almost too clever. So I, I, mean, I can't say I fully endorse it. So I just throw it out there. Right. But the total like physical world like collapse slash desiccation, et cetera, of the U.S. is something that's pushing the cloud power to actually have to be like even more ambitious and international and so on, right? So it's as if you turn your bounteous land into this rocky outcropping that doesn't produce anything. So you have to just go pure cloud for everything. Right. And where the U.S. is still very strong, immense strength, and perhaps arguably gaining strength, and it's hard to hard to quantify, is in its cloud power. You know, it's funny. It's like the other MAGA, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon. Haha. Right. But it's also a yeah, lot yeah. of the tech and so on and so forth, right? So... That is how I kind of see like the U.S. Uh, and it might be the disunited states rather than the United States, but mm-hmm. that that region, that group, the Americans, the post-Americans versus the Chinese, the Chinese, Chinese control, totally centralized, crackdown, AI surveillance right. state, and American anarchy, decentralization, etc. And I think something in the middle of recentralization, neither total mm-hmm. centralization nor total decentralization, but recentralization, voluntary recentralization. Yeah is, I think, where we want to aim for. And that's kind of what the book is about. Right. Um, let me ask you about, uh, there's a particularly, uh, I think, kind of intriguing uh, passage where you talk about how, because I want to talk more about uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency and blockchain and the both the technologies, but then also the kind of mentalities or sure. mindsets that undergird what you're talking about. And you write at one point, social media is American glasnost and cryptocurrency is American perestroika. Yes. So as the internet scaled and Americans actually got the rights to free speech and free markets that they were, that they were nominally promised, right. the establishment started to feel threatened. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Social media is American glasnost. Cryptocurrency is American perestroika. Right. So 
just to define those terms, right? In yeah. the eighties, um, Mikhail Gorbachev tried to open up the Soviet Union, and, and Glasnost was like more free speech, and Perestroika was mm-hmm. more free markets. Uh, you know, right. and um, what and he, found- he was doing that because he recognized, I mean, that the Soviet Union, even you know, this is post. Uh, Afghanistan invasion, or while it's still kind of lingering on, but the Soviet Union was declining in in material terms. They were not able to deliver what people wanted. He kind of wanted to be the Deng Xiaoping of the USSR and like pivoted towards something that was a little more open and whatnot, right? Um, And what, what what he found was he unleashed forces that were too strong. And the thing is, I mean, remember, the Soviet Constitution, in theory, it guaranteed all these rights, right? Right. It guaranteed, mm-hmm. you know, votes and human rights. And all yeah, it was better. It was it's better on paper than the American. Constitution. Yes. And on paper is about it because they would just shoot you yeah. in the back of the neck or disappear. You right. could log you, whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so in kind of the same way, um, the Internet was American Glasnost at, or social media is American Glasnost and cryptocurrencies American Perestroika because before social media, yeah, you not only had the right to free speech. Okay, but could you start a newspaper? Could right. you own a television station? Could you broadcast radio? No, you need a radio license, TV license. That stuff was heavily locked down. To get a sense of how locked down it was, if you remember the Unabomber, the Unabomber went mm-hmm. and killed a bunch of people. Why? Yep. So he could get an op-ed in the Post. Yeah, well, right. he got, and the New York Times. He really yeah. hit the trifecta. Right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or, well, the, the, not the Daily Double, I guess. Not, if he had gotten the Wall Street Journal, that would yeah. have been the trifecta. Yeah, yeah, right. And so that's how scarce distribution was back then. Yeah. That he had to kill for the distribution. Now, right. you have crazy people on Twitter who, they, they <laughs> you see you see the continuum, right? It, no, you, no, where Alex Jones, I mean, the most fascinating, or one of the many fascinating things about his uh, trial recently, his defamation or libel trial, whatever it was, uh, you know, is, how much money he was making despite being deplatformed everywhere. He was still pulling in tens of millions of dollars a year. Right. As a person who, you know, is not on YouTube, is not on Twitter, is not on Instagram or Facebook. Right. It's it's yeah. it's something where um so that's a bad part, you know, like you it, yeah. but but it's you know, the uh it's complicated. I I, I don't think where with Jones, I don't think he should be deplatformed, but I also think, right. you know, says a lot of things that I, that I screwed many things um but the, yeah he's uh, a batshit crazy insane person and that doesn't mean that he should be deplatformed yeah the, pro- the fundamental issue is um we're, we're talking about a lot of these things at one bit resolution and mm-hmm. basically we're talking about deplatforming because there was mass platforming mm-hmm. right that's say what happened yeah. before deplatforming is right. platforming and so yeah. billions of people were suddenly given a platform and so it's like a stock that went up 10 or 100 or 1,000 X, and now it's dropped 50%. And when people feel that voice that they were just given being taken away or mm-hmm. taken away by somebody who's there or even two or three or four hops right. in the social network, they're like, uh, am I going to be silenced to this thing that I just got, my voice, right? right. And so that's what I mean by that. But it's also thing. it's part of the rebundling or the recentralization of like Twitter, you know, rises and then it says, oh, you know what, maybe we don't want all of these people talking here and it doesn't mean they can't go elsewhere but they're not going to be talking on twitter well so yeah so fundamentally here's the thing if you administer any service you have to immediately make decisions about spam or porn or malware or stuff like that right that lets the i mean because that's just like universal everybody agrees on that okay right that lets the camels snout into the tent now you have Mm -hmm. the ability to filter you need to filter and now you have to decide where you're going to draw the line on many, many different ideological things, right? right. Because of this, um, and also because technology has made it easier to build these kinds of social networks, you're just going to eventually see, in my view, that every social group of sufficient scale will have its own social network, its own right. cryptocurrency, its own batch of territories, its own passport, and so on around the world, mm-hmm. and its community norms that sort of govern the use of all of that, right. such that these become like written laws. We're sort of in like the pre-Hammurabi, you know, the Hammurabi thing, you know, where uh, mm-hmm. things like the first code of laws, the first written code of laws. We're in sort of like the pre-Hammurabi era for digital due process. Right. Okay. okay. Where it's all or, just kind and of, okay. there's going to be, it's kind of like the Protestant uh, explosion of Protestant sects where there's going to be, uh, you know, an infinite number of Hammurabis, right? Yeah. 
That's right. Exactly. Coming in and out where they're writing their own codes, you know, legal codes, customs and all of that. And some of them will flourish. Some of them won't. That's right. And, and the thing is that, um, you know, today they've converged in a lot of ways, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, mm-hmm. and, and Apple. But, you know, back in the day, Microsoft was run by Gates and Apple was run by mm-hmm. Jobs and Google was run by Page and Amazon was run by Bezos. And these were these were strong personalities that had different cultures. If you had taken 25% of each company and done a round robin switcheroo on them, um, they wouldn't have worked, right? Obviously, Microsoft guys would have used Office and Google guys would have used Google Docs, right? right. Um, obviously, Google guys would use Android and Apple people would mm-hmm. use iOS or whatever, right? That's the obvious. But there's also a thousand other cultural things, abbreviations, ways of doing things. Apple is highly secret. Google is highly or was highly public, et cetera, et cetera, right? right? Now, today, now that they're founderless, they've started to converge into kind of this mass of big tech that's actually become a thing. You know, people move between those two, three years here, three years there, et cetera, just like the, right. the big four of accounting. Okay, they're in the post-founder era. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that when they did have sort of distinct cultures, it wasn't, they weren't fully interchangeable. And so that's going to, I think, happen with a bunch of these different cultures. They're all going to be, um, they're going to have an appeal to at least some fraction of humanity. And then there's places you might want to visit, but not live there as the you know saying right. goes, right? And uh, and I think that's good. That's certainly better than just endless conflict over basic premises. Right. Know? Or endless restriction of just saying, no, you don't, you never get a platform. I mean, yeah. you go back to the Unabomber world where, you know, there's a couple of newspapers and a couple of, uh, you know, networks that matter that's not optimal either yeah exactly and the thing is <clears throat> if folks who agree with each other have their own land and territory you'll get Sistine chapel and you'll get a taj mahal mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. those are different they can both kind of respect each other's accomplishments and, and whatnot but if you have 50 50 like you know then you're never going to build anything and just people are just going to fight and basic ideally premises. in that world like both the sistine chapel and here's the marxist in me uh you know both the sistine chapel and the taj mahal were also kind of built or you know uh you know uh, portuguese the the portuguese in brazil or you know in macau was built on slave labor in, in profound ways or in involuntary servitude mm-hmm. Um, so what you're talking about is like a world of proliferating Volition. communities, countries, states that are effectively voluntary. Voluntary. Absolutely yeah. voluntary. That, that's yeah, the yeah. ultimate ethical and justification. Yes. Yeah. So now uh, let's uh, I want to come back to crypto um, in a second. But then but you're saying that China, you think, at least for uh, the foreseeable future, because of the way they've architected their state and they took the hits early on by not participating in the open internet and whatnot, you think that they have the ability to kind of really hold down a different version yes. of of a kind of of a, of a centralized state that is calling the shots, and they don't need the buy-in of their people in the way that it's, these new communities. Do. It's complicated. Here's why this is complicated. Mm-hmm. So I actually do talk about other interpretations of the term network state, um, Estonia. Is like a state that's fused with the network in a certain way. They've got X Road, right. you know, their system, right? Singapore as China is a state that's fused with the network. They have, mm-hmm. you know, whereas in the, the U.S. is really fighting the network, it's doing antitrust and so on. China has just just decapitates Jack Ma, takes control of Alibaba, mm-hmm. decapitates it, decapitates that, and it's it's not, you know, in the U.S. the same kind of thing is trying. They're trying to do it with antitrust and whatnot. It's more of a fight. We'll see what actually happens. Well, okay. it, it but, remains to be seen. I mean, I, you know, one of the things is that, you know, going back to at least 2018, you had people like Tim Cook and Mark Zuckerberg and a variety of other leaders of, of big tech companies saying, hey, you know what? We want to be regulated. It's time to regulate. What I think, and they very much seem to me to be like the railroad barons at yes. the end of the 19th century who were like, hey, you know what? Our profits uh, are, are pretty kind of good. flat or declining right. and we want to lock in this yes. marketplace. And we'll, you know, let's let's sue for peace with the regulators. It, it's the quite, it's quite possible something like that happens where antitrust really means that the MAGA becomes or fuses with the U.S. South. And it's the most, you know, yeah. Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon are the most competent people that are now establishment aligned because a lot of the decentralists have left those companies and right. have become founders and whatnot. And so it's this weird thing where it used to be like media or the establishment versus tech. And now it's centralized tech and media 
yeah. versus a sometimes owned by tech, right? I mean, it's you don't want to read too much into yes. you know the Washington Post or whatever being owned by. Well, Jeff he doesn't Bezos, actually. But, yeah, Bezos. I mean, Bezos owns the Post, yeah. but he doesn't actually. You know, he. I mean, he probably just bought the Post as insurance. So you know, sure. These yeah. Uh, these organizations, as, as you're well aware, they, mm-hmm. they don't. Uh, just to digress on this topic. Um, the quote investigative journalist doesn't investigate their boss. They'll invest your, investigate yours. Okay? Right, right. No one, no, the New York Times is going through Salzburger's garbage or even naming right. Salzburger in any articles, but they'll right. name Zuckerberg a million times, right? Right. And right. so it's not so much that their owners get great coverage, they get no coverage, right? right. They're just airbrushed out as if they well, didn't. And then exist. you have that also the alternative of like NBC Universal Spectrum, you know, which is a different type of kind of. Yes, yeah, so that's just uh, a conglomerate of all these yeah. things where. Just yeah. somehow, th- there never happens to be an investigation into, like, Comcast's right. stuff, you know? Isn't mm-hmm. that interesting? Because Comcast is, like, the parent of it, right? Right. And mm-hmm. so it's it's often the absence of coverage rather than the presence of it. It's mm-hmm. not like there's hosannas for it. That'd be too obvious. It's just like, you know, that'd be a career-limiting move to go and investigate your boss's boss's boss, boss, so why don't you go and poke at this yeah. tech guy or whatever, right? So, um, so what's happened is actually, I think, uh, you, you've had defectors from media go to Substack. You've had defectors from tech become founders and funders. That's now a group, right? And you have the folks who are joiners are still at or, or joining. I mean, the kind of person who's joining Google in 2022 or, or whatever is completely mm-hmm. different from the kind of person who's joining in 2002. Just totally, right. totally different person. That's Now it's like the kind of person who joined like McKinsey or Bain or whatever. It's like a right. very... Or, or IBM or, a, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and, General and, Motors in 1955 or something. Uh, I mean, they are organization men and, rather and, and, than... And some of them, I assume, Maverick. are good people. Yeah, yeah, Right? And, and I've got you know, yeah. many, many like um, good engineers and folks there, but they're fundamentally yeah. not there to take a risk, right? This right. is the opposite yeah, of risk, yeah. you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so all the risk tolerant folks have come out. Uh, now, where was I? Is basically, uh, gosh, you got so me on this. So does does crypto, you know, uh, you know, how does crypto or blockchain allow for? Because I mean, because you're not arguing that uh, the establishment people in America, whether they're in the government or in tech, are necessarily going to win. Um, partly because no, of I think they're and then perestroika. They will yeah. have more power over fewer people. Because the U.S. establishment is currently fighting a simultaneous conflict against uh, conservatives, tech guys, Russia, China, to a lesser extent, Israel, India, France, Hungary, Brazil, the Brexit guys in Europe, and and more probably that I can't name, you know, or just like mm-hmm. off the top of my head, right? right. And uh, that's a lot of like simultaneous battles to be waging. You know, right. even if you're, you know, number one or whatever, you're just picking a fight with everybody at the same time. You're fighting your factory. You're, you're fighting a hot war with a nuclear power in Russia. You're fighting 50 percent of your population. You're fighting the tech guys in antitrust. You're, you're fighting all kinds of different groups at the same time. I kind of don't think that they can actually win all of those fights. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll see. The reason being is that. Winning all those fights would be hard, even for a really competent group of people. Mm -hmm. But this is now a group of people that rejects the very idea of competence. Mm -hmm. Right? The thing is, you know, excellence is not what the U.S. establishment prioritizes at all. all. They'll deny that excellence even exists. And uh, so, you know, the the, you you just can't be number one if you disagree with getting the people who are, you know, like like number one in their class. Right? Mm -hmm. If that's no longer the kind of person you're recruiting, you're not going to remain the number one most dominant world power, blah, 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 et cetera, right? It's kind of obvious to me. I don't know how long it takes because there's a lot of uh, momentum in something, yeah. but but I'm seeing that. And I, whether it's five years or two years or 10 years or 20 years, eventually it's something where um, it, it's, it's like a gigantic company versus a startup. And you know that giant company doesn't have as good a product. And it doesn't have right. as good talent, but it does have that inherited distribution. How long does it take for them to lose? I don't know. So it's it's a slow. It, it could be fast. It could be fast. It could be a slow it, decline. It, of, yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard yeah. for me to say. And the reason it's hard is because you know it's saying like bankruptcy. How does it happen? It's like gradually and then suddenly. Right. I, yeah. I I can have models where it's sudden. You can imagine some crazy yeah. stuff over a twenty twenty four, even twenty twenty two election. Uh, you can also imagine a gradual type of thing where people just 
you know, for example, when did people really recognize that the British Empire was over? Maybe right. it was post Suez. That's how people normally did it. But that's actually yeah. like probably 11 years after it actually happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you would think that people would have understood that at least after World War II, if yeah. before World War II. But, and I, I actually, I think that America may be in a moment where our quality of living isn't going to go down, our standard of living, but we are not as powerful as we once might have been because the world is radically altered and there's just multiple poles of power, right. which is part of what your book is about. Can I ask with, Good. with China, part of the, you know, they, okay, okay there, just, it's a non, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say one thing, which is um, when I see this, some kind, some people will be like, oh my God, you're so anti-American, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing is, there's more vantage points than being just anti-American or like, right. you know, jingoist, you know, like, yeah. uh, for example, are, are you anti-British or pro-British? Well, in a real sense, America is post-British, right? right. India is post-British, Israel is post-British, Singapore is post-British. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they're negative on Great Britain. In fact, right. there's a lot of respect for Great Britain and all of its accomplishments and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for all of the accomplishments of the U.S., in the past, potentially in the future, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I do think that that post-American kind of world is there because you have a billion yep. Chinese, you have a billion Indians, you have all these people coming yep. online. And India doesn't have a seat at the UN Security Council. China wasn't part of that world order. This is not a world order that, you know, they're, they're going to just simply accept. And right. so that's why they're pushing on in different ways. And there will be some kind of new thing. Uh, what form that takes, I hope, and what I'm trying for is, one which has room for liberal values, right? And the issue yeah. is that those kinds of values are often the first things jettisoned when people feel a sense of loss or threat. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of not just Trump, but also kind of Hillary Clinton's yeah. platform in 2016. It's like it's about controlling and rolling things back to a past where we felt more comfortable. And that's a that's a, an obvious loser. Right? It, exactly. The thing is, it, you know, some people want to go back to 1950 or 1980. I understand that, but then yeah. a big part of the U.S. establishment, Democrats want to go back to let's say 2007, sometime when these this internet stuff wasn't disrupting everything, right? And the right. farther in the future we go, the farther in back that Halcyon era comes. Um, and in many ways, they've stolen many issues from Trump. Like you know, for example, um, they're as hawkish on China, for example. Right. You might agree yeah. with that. But basically, like that was sort of a silently still an issue in 2015. Remember, people were mocking China, uh, Trump. Uh, he was saying uh, China, 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 like that yeah. remember that video. Right. That was like a subject of mockery in 2019. Obama. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. No, no. I'm t I, I totally agree with you. And yeah. like Biden is like, oh, he's great because he's a China hawk. Right? right. So, you know, in 2019, for example, just to give you a sense of how recent this is, Barack and Michelle Obama put out a film called American Factory, which was sort of the old school multilateral economic, you know, liberalism, where American Factory is talking about how, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, money came in and helped restore an American factory and put Americans to work. It was talking up cross border trade. That's like, you know, like Q3, Q4 2019, really not that long ago. Feels right. like a completely different era. Right. No, it's like from 1919 or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So you go back and just watch that. Watch like, you know, like uh, the Obamas talk about this and how, you know, th they're they're still coming from that era of like multilateral trade and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, by the way, unlike some people who think it's all nationalism from out here, it's all, you know, retreat to this. I agree that's a trend. I think there's also the counter trend. That's to say you have the nationalist socialism, you know, uh, or socialist yeah. nationalism on the land, but you have the internationalist capitalism in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the people of the state and the people of the network. You right. have really, this is actually the, this is the communism versus capitalism of the 20th century right. is centralized, decentralized, you know, land versus cloud, you know? So let me ask uh, quickly, because I, I want to get to those, I, the stack of identities and how that will play out in the, you know, when you're in the cloud, meaning you're also in land somewhere, but the Chinese Communist Party mm -hmm. kind of and as it's as it rebundles, as it centralizes control over the past decade or so, it one of the ways, even though it doesn't have to ask permission because it can round people up and put millions of people in concentration camps, right, which they seem to be doing, they can lock down, you know, they can nail people into their apartments because of zero COVID. 
One of the ways they've been doing that is by promising massive increases in living standards and economic growth. And, they, and they've delivered on that since Dang. Yes, but they're um, not delivering on it as much anymore. Yeah, that's what I mean. Is yeah. so like is that where is that where the the Chinese centralization model goes to die the minute that productivity growth, you know, drops to, you know, one, two, three percent, much less negative. And then suddenly they've sent a lot of people abroad who go to colleges all over America and are like, Why am I going back to a country where I might be put in prison or jail when I can hang out here and have like a fucking really easy and good and fun and exciting life. Yeah. So it's, this is complicated in several different ways, right? Basically it's absolutely true that you know, China's a big country, obviously, and they've got yeah. their own partisan divide. It's just, um, here, here's one way of expressing it. Uh, within Apple, um, there's going to be a difference of opinion as to, let's say, uh, I'm making this up because I actually don't know what Apple's internal politics are. But let's say there's some people who really want to do the mm-hmm. iCar, right? The Apple car. Yeah. And there's other people who are like, we just need to double down on the phone or whatever. Okay. Right. And you're going to have executives in charge of both these groups. Now, what you don't see, or you haven't seen, maybe we will see it, is these guys get out on Twitter and try to demagogue, you know, right. John Smith is so stupid. You know, we need to do the right. Apple car. If you're an Apple, you know, loyal Appleist you know, right. thumbs up me, right? They don't run a public campaign on this because right. what that would do is it would polarize Apple's customer base against each other. And this would eat the seed corn, you know, that that yeah. dissension, everybody's mm-hmm. throwing mud at each other. There's less economic mm-hmm. value in the whole pie and so on and so forth. Instead, their mental model is, all right, let's settle this behind closed doors. Let's figure it out. And ultimately the whole thing is disciplined by exit. People will, you know, buy yeah. or not buy Apple products or whatever, right? Right. Now, in China, they've actually made which is good. kind of what happened at, uh, I guess, like Fairchild Semiconductor, right in Silicon yeah, Valley. Fo- in the 50s. Folks, yes, uh, the, yeah, so the the quote trader estate where they all left and mm-hmm. kind of went. Yeah, so yeah, um, this is somewhat similar to how things work in China. Basically, just like you know, somebody on the outside sort of has to guess about Apple's corporate politics. It's not something that is parsed and dice. Maybe there's some magazines that talk about it, but unless you're on the inside, you don't really know. It's a bit speculative, right? right? Um, it's certainly not something where the executives are going out and declaring, I'm an iCar and I'm an iPhoneer or whatever. Like right. that, that, that partisan divide is not a public divide, right? This is similar to kind of the dynamic within the Chinese Communist Party. There are factions, but they don't go out and declare themselves, I am the internationalist capitalist, I'm the, you know, the, the uh, Hu Jintao, you know, yeah. Deng Jiang wing of the party, mm-hmm. or I'm the Xi Jinping wing or whatever. They, or, I mean, some people know this, but it's not like a publicly labeled thing. It's not broadcast. This is the internal knife fighting, whatever, right. you know, that they do behind closed doors. Um, and the rest of the population has to sort of speculate on that. All right. So there is a partisan divide. It's just not as explicit. It's more like corporate politics. Yeah. Uh, with that said, there's lots of people who are now just finding their, you know, first is the COVID lockdowns, but second, it's also the random bankruptcies of companies. Mm-hmm. And third, it's, the common prosperity doctrine, which is kind of like mm-hmm. a quasi return to communism yeah. and, and on and on. It's actually becoming, it reminds them of the battle days, you know, right. where there's an arbitrary yeah. state and they weren't able to make money. When, when people like Jack Ma effectively get disappeared or, you know, the, uh, the founder of Apple news or, you know, actresses suddenly yeah. kind yeah. of disappear and then, you know, make, trite statements and things like that yeah it's it's something that, yeah where if in in the u.s to first order you can't be woke enough in china you can't be nationalist enough right right like you know for example there's a professor who criticized this recent movie called the battle of lake Changjin, and that was a movie where it shows like the brave chinese fighting the americans during the korean war and winning okay and a lot of chinese movies nowadays wolf warrior two battle of lake Changjin, show Chinese individuals or soldiers beating Americans either implicitly or explicitly coded as such, right? Yeah. Um, and China's become the largest like box office of the of the world. In many ways, they're sort of running the American playbook of the 20th century, just bigger. I mean, you know, American yeah. dream, Chinese dream. American movies, right. giant Chinese movies. American armada, giant Chinese drone armada, right? right? So they're kind of running the American playbook of the 20th century, just like a huge scale. Right. Okay? Um, 
it gets complicated though too if the Amer you know if the american hollywood ideal is the rugged individualist who triumphs over things right that may not work well and you know it, it's it's, yeah. it's a great story but it's well, what, telling a different message to yeah. chinese people what right? you should do is yeah well so what they do is they take it's it's sort of disorienting you should watch wolf warrior 2 or battle of lake chang what uh -huh. they do is uh, they take a lot of the filmmaking convention, some things I wouldn't be able to even verbally articulate, but it feels like right. Rocky or Rambo or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, or, or Saving Private Ryan, right? But yeah. it's, you know, a Chinese hero and an American villain, right? The reason right. this is different is obviously there's American movies that show the American military or whatever as a villain, but usually it's yeah. also an American on the other side who's a hero, like the brave right. activist who stands, yeah. right? So there, that's, it's a problem. It's a problem within the culture, right? Versus yeah. this does feel disorienting because it's playing like Yankee Doodle Dandy as like the the villain music, you right. know. It's just like, what yeah. you know, right? So, uh, so to your point, they take a lot of the Hollywood aesthetic, and but but they've they've swapped out some of the themes for like the Chinese nationalism. Anyway, so right. the thing is that a lot of Chinese liberals, internationalists and capitalists and so on, are uh, you know there's this thing there's like three sayings and uh, saying there's three things you can do in China. You can, it's like rat race, lie flat, uh, or run, run zoo, run philosophy. So rat races, join the rat race, whatever. Lie flat is sort of, in the US, they call it quiet quitting. They just kind of, right. you know, don't do anything. Sir. And then run philosophy is exit, right? Yeah. And there's a GitHub thing called run philosophy where it's in Chinese. And it's like how to get to Australia, how to get to this, how to get to that, mm -hmm. right? And so that's very appealing to a bunch of, you know, Chinese youth. Um, and so China's just not a monolith, right? They're, right. they're yeah. you know, obviously a huge, huge country with a lot, yeah. a lot of internal differences. Right. Um, but I do think that if there's one thing they are set up for, it is to quote, maintain territorial integrity and um, to like surveil the country and so on. You, you said, yeah. will there be dissension and so on? The thing is, they control the educational system, right? So all the premises that people have installed into their heads at an early age are fundamentally Chinese nationalist premises. They're taught Mao is right. seven parts good and three parts bad. Um, they're not taught really that he killed millions of people, whatever. Right. right? Uh, they actually, you know, Chiang Kai-shek is being rehabilitated. He's more popular to some extent in mainland China than he is in Taiwan. <laughs> Do you know that? No, that's fascinating. Because, uh, you know, sometimes yeah. there's folks who fight like cats and dogs. Yeah, and then yeah. like 50 years later, 60, there's, they, they, there's a rapprochement. Like, for example, Protestant and Catholic. Oh, yeah. Right, they fought like cats yeah, and dogs. I mean, uh, Fran France and Germany are and like Germany. allies, right? It, it's like kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing. That's right. And so, yeah. um, the communist nationalists obviously fought viciously, but now yeah. it's something like, well, you know, Chang was actually still pretty good because he fought against the Japanese. He was just misguided. Right. We will eventually reunify yeah, Taiwan. Yeah. That's like the messaging, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, where their civilizations at? You should just watch their movies to get a sense of where their head is at. It's just right. totally different than where. I'm, I'm confident yeah. that uh, mass media sends so many disparate messages, and I'm, I'm a big believer in, in reception theory or, or response theory. And so, I'm reminded of uh, you know uh, supposedly Stalin during the uh, uh, when he was in charge of the Soviet Union brought uh, over the grapes of wrath movie because he wanted everybody in Russia in, in the Soviet Union to see the depredations of capitalism. And they and the all final loved scene it. is the, yeah, yeah, and the final scene is the Okies leaving the Dust Bowl and moving to California in cars. And supposedly the takeaway was, wow, in America even poor people have cars. Right, right. right. Um so you you never you know, and it might take longer or shorter, um, and clearly China has a more systematic indoctrination process there education system is probably better than ours in that sense japan's was like that germany's was like that but you know you fuck up right. uh, especially once people get a little bit of wealth uh, you know yeah. then they start they want to call their shot so but. so the interesting thing is perhaps um you know this is one of my theses also in the book is that perhaps in mm -hmm. this cold war the quote third world comes in first right the third world right. is actually right. web three it's not the non-aligned movement but the aligned movement mm -hmm. it's yeah. the american you know, let's call them classical liberals, you know, true liberals, you know, basically the um, the post-establishment or anti-establishment and the Chinese liberals and, you know, folks from India and Israel and all these folks in the middle who neither want to be kind of ruled by like U.S. media and, and tech corporations, mm -hmm. nor 
Do they want to be, you know, dominated by like, you know, WeChat surveilling everything, right? Right. And, and those are basically, you know, at least the two options on the table right now, right? Yeah. Because for many countries that are in the middle of the sort of border zone, if you're in Africa or something yeah. like that, is your software stack the American stack or the Chinese stack? And both right. of them come with positives and negatives. That yeah. Right. So can we can we talk about, because you, you talk about in the book Web3, and that's, right. you know, a buzzword, which, you know, always needs clarification sure. whenever it's invoked. And you're talking about it now. How is, you know, how, when you talk about Web3 and what about this alternative position, um, yeah, what sure. what is it? And then I want to talk about identity stacks as sure. opposed to kind Fine. of technical stacks. So there's yeah. different ways of talking about Web3. One of them, there's an illustration, which is Web1 is log in with username and password, type it in. Right. Web2 is you click and you log in with Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Web3 mm -hmm. is you're logging in with your private key or your Ethereum wallet or what have you. And right. the difference is that um, that combines certain aspects of Web 1 and Web 2. Uh, you have the um, local password and the local credentials and so on, okay? But you're logging into a global service. Um, another way of thinking about Web 1 versus Web 2 versus Web 3, I've talked about this you know, at, at some length, is you know, Web 1 and also really the early internet was genuinely peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? Client and server were basically equal. You could send email back and forth, et cetera, okay? Um, and it was open source and programmable and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Then with Web 2.0, um, this is a little bit of a retcon because at the time Web 2.0 was thought of as a front-end thing, but let's talk about the back-end. Web 2.0, you had the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Dropbox and these centralized services where, see, the thing is, um, Every time you refresh Facebook or Twitter, if you had to send your entire profile information and everything you did to somebody else, mm -hmm. that'd be very redundant. So instead, both of you connect to a hub and you pull the information right. from there. And so then you just sell, yeah. send small updates, right? That hub is very efficient and it gives you so-called global states. So all these nodes have something global yeah. they can write to. But it's also a place where you can make huge profits because you can serve the ads right. there and so on and so forth. So this is basically the backend architecture of the last twenty years. Web three takes the best in my and if, view. And if I may, just on the on the front end of that, though, what what Web two or or social media or user generated content, something like Facebook allows you your content conceivably or YouTube is maybe a better example to be seen by lots of people. Yes, but it's no longer peer to peer because you're going to yes, an YouTube intermediary who is then distributing it. And then also, you know, they can serve yeah, ads control. against it. They can also censor it, et cetera. That's right. That's uh, right. But validate it and verify it in, in, That's a, right. in a positive way. It's not all negative. That's right. That's right. So the Web3 version is that central hub and spoke, the hub of the hub and spoke, is now replaced by a decentralized database. And many of them, there's different, you know, there's Ethereum and, and, yeah. and so on, right? And Bitcoin and whatnot. Um, and that decentralized database has aspects of both Web1 and Web2. Why? It is open source, it's programmable, and it's transparent and so on, like mm -hmm. Web1. But it also has that central hub, which actually allows for a great deal of profit. It, ha it offers global state. There's a global mm -hmm. database that's now available. Um, but yet it's also peer to peer. And that is really what a blockchain is. It's a data structure that combine that basically is a, anybody is a root user of a blockchain. That's a fundamental new thing of the blockchain. It's a massively multi-user database, right? Where any user is a root user. Whereas, um, for example, for Twitter or Facebook, the password to Twitter or Facebook's database is not on the internet, right? With uh, with a blockchain, you everybody can read every row that's in the Bitcoin or Ethereum database. It's public on, on the internet. That's a fundamental difference, right? It's not open source, it's open state. Now, I know that might sound technical, but it's a, just a true shift in what the backend architecture of a system is. It can belong to all the folks who run the nodes or run the stakers or run the miners and so on in that community. And they can, by mutual consent amongst themselves, host whatever content they want. And uh, the development of these blockchains creates huge amounts of money, okay? Which is important because it funds the whole thing. So now you have a model which combines some of the good aspects of Web 1 and the good aspects of Web 2, and that's Web 3. And this, by the way, is something I think about a great deal. It's like the helical theory of history, where you sort of wind upwards, mm -hmm. you know? It's cyclical, X of T equals cos of T and Y of T equals sine T on, on, on one plane, but Z of T equals T, and so you have a parametric curve that kind of spirals upwards. Cyclical in some ways, mm -hmm. progressive in other ways, right? 
And so, for example, you have gold, then you have fiat currency, and then you have Bitcoin, right? Mm-hmm. Or you have the you know paper document, and then you have a scanner, and then you have uh, the fully digital document, right? right. And um, I think one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, you have the city state, and then you have the roll up of a bunch of city states into a nation state, where all these independent little principalities get rolled up into one big thing that has a huge amount of scale. That's why, just like gold was sort of defeated by fiat currency, the city state was defeated by the nation state. And so then the V3 is, in my view, the network state, which combines some of the scalability and defensibility uh, of the, the nation state with the agility uh, and independence of the city state, right? So like the V3. This is like a common theme in a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. About. So, so, you know, let's talk about identity in in this newer state and in, in the network state world because you know one of the things that i found most interesting because we talk here in the united states a lot about intersectionality and it's, <laughs> you know sure which uh, but it's a kind of you know what i think people the, the positive version of intersectionality and i think it's something we all recognize is that we are an amount each of us is an amalgam of you know a dozen or maybe a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand identities sub identities you know, and it's like we might define ourselves as male, uh, male and female. We might, you know, as American or not American. We might, uh, uh, you know, I was raised in New Jersey, so I'm a New Jersey. I'm a libertarian. That's part of my identity. And these all things stack up. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, and then, but where will those, I guess, two things. One, where do those identities come from in this newer world? And then also you talk, uh, particularly in a, in a in a interesting and kind of funny section where you were talking about how like you would complain to people about San Francisco and how fucking shitty it's getting, yeah. and then people who are San Francisco Patriots would be like "fuck you" and they didn't want to hear anything, yes. even though they obviously know there's a lot of truth to you know like if you know there's human feces all right. over the place like something's got to be done, but where where do those primary like patriotic identities which ultimately become the, the kind of root level identity right. uh, in this world and how, you know, what is a way to create a, uh, you know, I guess kind of like an awareness and a recognition and a comfort with these multiple identities. And then also to make sure that people understand that they, you know, they are forming them whether they explicitly do or not. And how do you, you know, how do, how do we work with that patriotic identity, which is resistant to, Criticism, critique, change, and adaptation. Right. It gets in the way. Great question. Let me answer that. Let me talk about intersectionality for a second. So, yeah. um, so the section you're referring to in the book is where, you know, I was talking to someone about SF, and I was eventually I realized that uh, some people are patriotic about their city, others about their country, others about their company, still others about their cryptocurrency. So right. the guy who's like identifies as a New Yorker, for them, the job doesn't, I mean, the job is a way to pay the bills, but what they really care about is Central Park and the bagels yeah. and the lifestyle yeah. of New York and so on. And that's like primary to them. They just non-negotiable yeah. is New York, New York first, right? Then there's somebody who doesn't care that much to say about their city, but they really care about their country. They're a patriot. Mm-hmm. You know, they fly the flag. Yeah. You know, they have uh, Independence Day. They serve, they've got generations. They serve in the military or something like that, right? They're, they're right. a patriot. Okay. Then there's folks in tech who often identify very much with their company. This is the thing I founded. Yeah. This is my baby. I'm building this and so on and so forth. The country is a parameter because they've got a multinational if it's successful. And, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're in many different jurisdictions. Uh, the city is also a parameter because they might have to hop city to city. I'm based here today. I'm based there today, right? But the company is their constant. That's the thing they really, truly care about. And then finally, you have folks nowadays who identify their cryptocurrency, right? Mm-hmm. They actually, like Bitcoin maximalists will hate yeah. many companies and they're, internationalists and you know they they certainly don't have that much affection for the city but they are bitcoin only right right and so kind of once you see this once you realize oh almost everybody's a patriot about something and that's often the thing it's a thing they think of as non-negotiable where a critique of it is often treated as an insult and they have to get out of their own head to realize that people are sort of critiquing the thing and not themselves right for example as a founder of a company you will often take negative feedback extremely personally. And what you have to do is, um, you know, once you kind of get older, you realize, okay, it's, it's, it's basically like, 
In the same way you see a product that you that you don't like, you say it sucks. It doesn't mean you hate the founders and you hate all the people behind it or whatever. It was, just, it was like a casual observation, right? right? You end up making those kinds of observations much less after you built a product because you're like, wow, that was actually really hard to do. Okay. And we also do is you write down those comments or you have somebody else write them down and they filter out all the negative adjectives and they try to turn them into bugs. And what you often find is somebody who is negative about something isn't really that negative. They just want to fix something. They tried to use it right. and it didn't work and then they want you to fix something. Okay. So coming back up, basically, once you realize that people are patriotic about something, you can marry this to the concept of the identity stack, which is what is your top level identity? Um, that's say when you describe yourself to your, to others, to yourself, to, you know, uh, on forms, whatever, um, are you an American? Are you a New Yorker? Are you a... And in a particularly Uber? sad but illustrative example, you uh, talked about a Twitter bio for a guy named Jim. Yes. Who's a Steeler fan. It's like basically his a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. Yes. It's that, like his highest level identity. That's right. And that's what people used to do in like the 2000s yeah. or what have you. And right. now they've switched it to like, you know, more ideological and tribal. Pound BLM, yeah. pound BTC, pound this, pound that. Right. And what that is is something where um, people will attack somebody over their Twitter bio, not infrequently. You know, you'll comment right. and be like, "Oh, dumb name, bunch of numbers," or something like. That. Yeah, yeah. And so what that means is, whatever you put in your identity, people are forced to deliver. They've chosen it, and they're forced to deliver repeated apologetics for that identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have pound Bitcoin, you're going to defend Bitcoin ten times a day if you comment on Twitter. If you have pound this, you have pronouns, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is something where it becomes something where when you've vocalized that defense over and over again, where you're fighting for it, you've, you've made that choice. You you've identified with those things, you know, those moral premises, this is an identity formation process. Okay. And, um, those identities don't necessarily map to geography. And, uh, so, you know, what you're going to have, this is related to the network share concept. Those identities, I think, some of them are conducive to the formation of functional communities, and some of them will be distilled out of the internet into these functional communities. Okay. The other thing you mentioned is intersectionality. So I think I may have this in the book, or this may be in V2, but here's kind of a, a little bit of observation with that. Intersectionality turns us all into oppressors. And what do I mean by that? So you know how communism, it promised liberation for the workers and the peasants, you know, the, the workers paradise, right? And actually delivered them into slavery. Right. They, you know, communism was a gulag, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Trotsky's White Sea Labor Canal. People had to dig a canal with their fingers till they froze off and then they just mm -hmm. shot them, you know. So it was absolutely not better than what they had before. It was far, far, far worse. Um, but it was justified in the name of the workers and the peasants forever for 70 years. Mm -hmm. Right. This totalitarian state. And, uh, you know, intersectionality is comparable in a way, which is it promises you know, like gains for women and minorities and so on, but several observations. First is, it's rare to find a, an ultra woke person who's actually a fan of a, of a female or minority CEO. They want, in theory, them to become CEOs or leaders and hate all the ones who actually become successful because now they're rich and powerful and successful, so therefore right. they should be torn down, number one, okay? Number two is, with intersectionality, everybody's an oppressor on some axis. For example, mm -hmm. like, 50% uh, of the world um, is uh, male and 20% um, is, so let's say 20%, 10% of the world is white and 50% is male and 90% is straight and 99% is cis and, you know, whatever percent is wealthy and so on and so forth. They're successful, blah, blah. You know, th there's a bunch of different axes and you're probably white or male or straight or cis or something else, right? And what you find is when you when you realize this, okay, whenever the establishment wants to attack somebody, what they will do is a, an algebra where they'll find on what category is this person an oppressor, okay? Are they mm -hmm. um, a uh, white woman? Well, they're white, so blam, hit them on that, right? Are yeah. they a black man? Well, toxic masculinity, right? There right. is a word, a phrase on the shelf mm -hmm. to delegitimize them, to call them an oppressor, and right. therefore victimize them on any axis, Right. So everybody who kind of buys into the intersectionality thing, it's actually very similar to communism, where all these workers thought, hey, with strikes, we're building collective power and so on and so forth. And there was short term gains because right. strike basically meant that they got redistribution of wealth within yeah. a company. You know, their wages went up. 
It just made the company less competitive and it collapsed over the long run, or they all fell into the gulag in the Soviet Union. Right. With with the woke, basically for them, the equivalent of the strike is actually, it's not the factory floor, but it's the social media app that's mm-hmm. the, the site of the collective action and it's a cancellation and the redistribution is not of wealth, but of status. Right. Instantly you get a bunch of likes for saying that somebody is mansplaining or that they're, mm-hmm. you know, white supremacy, whatever it is, one of these, one of these phrases. And uh, what that does though, is it means that, you know, the person who's saying, oh my God, you're mansplaining today can be attacked as white supremacist tomorrow, can be attacked as, right. you know, ex phobic or And you've created, I mean, because if the whole point is to constantly be showing oppression, the minute somebody becomes successful, then they're, they're an they oppressor. Have to be taken. I mean, it's like there's an old Monty Python sketch with a, a roadside bandit who steals from the rich and gives to the poor. And then like once he redistributes the income, it's like, oh, well, you're rich. So I have to take that back and give it to the formerly rich, et cetera. A, I mean, it's, a, it's exactly, a, exactly. That's right. And so once you kind of see this, it's um, it's basically something that's very structurally similar to communism in that it promises the world and delivers oppression. It promises freedom, delivers oppression. And so let me ask go you. OK, go ahead. And so now the alternative, though, to intersectionality, I don't believe is sort of the, um, you know, kind of conservative mentality of basically saying, OK, everybody needs to stay in their place and, right. you know, go back to 1950s and so on and so forth. I think there's an alternative, like, again, a V3, which is, yeah. um, you know, all must become excellent. OK, mm-hmm. well, this is actually coming out in the V2 of the book and whatnot. But um, basically, I think a lot about. Um, ascendance, transcendence. Mm-hmm. Okay, how do we become the best version of ourselves? Mm-hmm. And there's so much you can throw at that because when people say they quote want equality, very few people say that they actually want a reduction in their standard of living such that the world can become more equal, right. or a reduction in their status. When they say they want equality, they're always looking up at some guy, some person yeah. who's got higher money or higher status, and they're right. thinking they're going to take some money from this rich guy take some status, they'll finally be respected. Right. They're almost never saying, look, I am, you know, a U.S. citizen, therefore I'm among the richest few percent in the world. Right. Therefore I'm going to, I mean, maybe the effective altruists do this. Okay. Right. But the vast majority of people who think about equality think they're below 50th percentile on something. I right. think they're going to gain from it. Right. Now, if we just identify the goal being the gain, yeah. the alternative to a promise of equality that actually leads to oppression is excellence, right? That is to say, to allow people to become the best version of themselves. Okay, so right. what is this? This is transhumanism. Okay, this is, I know some people don't like that word. Okay, you could call it transcendence. You could call it optimism. Right. There's a positive version. This is like actualization, where you're it's, giving people the resources to develop themselves as they want to develop. Exactly. It is the most yeah. knowledgeable, fittest, healthiest, wealthiest, most successful version of yourself, right? And to push the locus of control back to the individual. And it's the, you know, what I call the win and help win kind of philosophy. And this is not live and let live. Okay. Just to go through right. this, right. You know, the, the, the traditional conservative is stay at home and they're not ambitious. Uh, and, you know, they're just taking care of family and, and what have you, right. The progressive is um, ambitious, but they're often very zero sum. Your win mm-hmm. is somebody else's yeah. loss. We must take from the rich, get to the right? right? The libertarian is live and let live, which is a little house on the prairie kind of thing. And then the, I think the technologist or the optimalist should be win and help win, okay? Mm-hmm. And that's neither of the previous three. It's not yeah. conservative because it's highly ambitious. It's not progressive because it is positive sum. But it's also not libertarian because it's a collective. It is a group right. of people. You are winning and then you are investing in the next person. It's not simply yeah. everybody just on their own, isolated, because you'll lose by the live and let live is usually lose because yeah. you're just on your own. Right. Go ahead. I would like to point out that even Galt's Gulch, I, I don't know what the fire department situation in Galt's sure. Gulch was, but it, it was a community. But yeah, I, I like the way that you talk about that. And it leads me to uh, maybe a final point of conversation. Sure. What you know, what does the global poor look like in a network state world? Because a lot of what you're talking about and i think a critique of it or you know and i've seen people talk about this it's like well look at you you know your uh your heritage is indian right asian indian yeah. you grew up in long island which is you know obviously a hell on earth but you escape long island and go to <laughs> california 
then you leave the United States. But you are mobile. You're a, a rootless cosmopolite. You're an internationalist. You have the means and the ability to do whatever you want. You talk about the Indian diaspora. And it's like most of the people who leave India are doing pretty well. But, you know, what about the people, what about the poor in India or the poor in, um, you know, the deindustrialized Midwest of America? Like what, it, you know, how will they function in a world where the rest of us, and I'm including myself in this camp perhaps sure. strongly, of like, you know, where, well, I can actualize. I've, I've got the means, the motive, and the opportunity to, to, you know, be partly in America and partly in the cloud and all of that kind of stuff. Totally. So a few things. First is, um, let me actually contest the label of rich and poor in the following sense. I think okay. it's actually interesting to talk about the ascending class and the descending class, and then also the ascending world, the descending world, right? Why ascending class, descending class, right? First of all, that gives the sense of dynamism, that some are going up and some are going down, right? Many of the folks, for example, the Brooklyn wokes who hate tech, right? I would not, of course, I wouldn't include you in this category, but they're actually fairly well off, but they're in the descending class, right? Mm -hmm. Conversely, an Indian, you know, who just got a 5G LTE smartphone and is on the internet mm -hmm. for the first time, they're in the ascending class, right? They may be poor, but they're in the ascending class, but you can be rich in the descending class. Yeah. And it is mm -hmm. ascending versus descending, I think, more than the absolute value of rich versus poor that people emotionally key on, right? Because if you tell somebody who's like upper middle class in the US, but now their expense account that they had at Time Magazine in the early 2000s is gone, and now they're clickbait, and they have to move in mm -hmm. back with their parents at age 40, they don't like this tech thing. That's resulted right. in their view. It's correlated with the material reduction in standard of living. Whereas the Indian or the Latin American or what have you, who is um, you know fortunate enough to have gotten a phone and also... Um, is in a country that's gone up in its wealth over the last, you know, several years, decades, they feel this tech thing is awesome because they're in the ascending class, even if there's still an order of magnitude or more gap in GDP per capita, right? Right. So that's first, that's ascending class, descending class. Then, and this is related to like Churchin's concept of elite overproduction, but it's a little different because mm -hmm. it also identifies the ascending part, right? Number one. Right. The second thing is you can take this from individuals and you can map it to, or, or small groups like classes, uh, or societal groups, and you can talk about the ascending world and the descending world, right? And these, you know, the Dickens thing, like it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Yeah. The ascending world and descending world exist within every country now. They exist within every apartment building. You have mm -hmm. some person who's doing great online and the other person who's just gotten canceled. And that can literally mm -hmm. happen 30 feet away, right? right? People's fortunes are less tied to each other by geography. They're tied by the social network. So the ascending world and descending world, the good part about it is... Anybody has this phone, which is becoming a skyhook, you know, to yeah. opportunity, yeah, right? Yeah. Billions of people have gotten this. That's a good part. The bad part is if you were relying implicitly or explicitly on geographical protections for something, if you were a average ability person in a wealthy country, now you've got global competition and you've got something where, um, you know, lots of monopolies and stuff around, you, not just the individual level, but the you know, for example, Hollywood and others, they've, they've got massive competition now from AI. Hollywood's going to get melted, yeah. I think, in the next few years from, from AI. That individual is subject to competition. The company that employed him is subject to competition. The country uh, or the city that surrounds him is subject to competition of, from many different directions, from technology, from new people online in a way they haven't had before. So that's the, you know, that's the ascending world and the descending world, the ascending class, descending class. And that, I think, is a much better lens to talk about than, quote, rich versus poor, because, you know, mm -hmm. I've been reasonably successful, but certainly if you go back one or two generations, I, I, I doubt my family was in the top 50th percentile of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we weren't, you know, like I'm at, at, you know, if it's an exponential, if you graph their whatever net worth, it's like, it's like this, right? And yeah. so I'm part of the ascending class, you know, and uh, that's something where, you know, I own a debt to all my ancestors and whatnot, but... It's uh, it's something where it's not like, oh, you're born with this huge fortune or something like that. I think there's a huge mm -hmm. difference between born rich and built rich. You know, the right. word rich needs that prefix, right? Born rich is like a neptus, like, like, um, like Arthur mm -hmm. Salzberg, who inherited the New York Times company and has all right. these employees that call everybody else rich and never write about his mansion and, you know, the fact that he inherited it from his father's 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 father. Zuckerberg is the son of a dentist. Whatever else you can say about him, he built that fortune. And yes, he went to Harvard or whatever. Thousands yeah. of people have gone to Harvard and haven't built what he built. Lots of other people have the same opportunity to not do that, right? 
And um, there's an enormous moral difference between the born rich and the built rich. And much of the people who are complaining about, quote, rich are the born rich complaining about the ascending class. OK, so that's like I mean, it's also called old money versus new money, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. let's call let's take that one thing. And that's a moral point where basically, um, you know, let's 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 take that as one filter. OK, the second is a lot of the built rich. What we're doing is we're investing in letting everybody learn to code, giving everybody tools. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's Figma, which is sold for 20 billion. That's a relatively cheap online tool. It is a universal communications device. Right. It is cryptocurrency. It is basically global equality of opportunity, global freedom of speech, opening up and investing so that anybody can invest in anybody else. You know, for example, this is a, this is a very high profile example. But when Peter Thiel invested in Mark Zuckerberg, um, Thiel was much wealthier than Zuckerberg. Now, Zuck is much wealthier than Thiel, but Thiel also gained out of that deal. That is yeah. genuinely positive sum. The reason I bring this up is this is actually the fundamental difference between investment and charity. OK, with charity, um, it is portrayed. And what I'm talking about, by the way, is organized charity. Let's factor out, you know, your neighbor's house burns down from a lightning strike. Of course, go and organize, you know, like community donations and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Right. What I'm, just like people talk about, like religion versus organized religion. Right. So organized charity, industrialized charity is constantly is basically, a, a, you know, both charity and investment. There's like a rich person and there's a queue of people who are there to get either grants or investments. They're there to get money from the rich guy, okay? And with charity, they have an incentive to be as pathetic, as sympathetic as possible. In extremists, this leads to the scene in Slumdog Millionaire, where the guy chops off the limbs of the beggar to make them more pathetic. But right. you'll see all these people, you know, online who have developed, you know, I'm depressed, I'm, I'm X, I'm Y, I'm Z, I'm a victim in this, this, and that way. They've internalized all of this. Why? Because the way to win the oppression Olympics and thereby get either the status of like a like or a RT or something, mm -hmm. or a grant, you know, from in charity when they're applying to an agency or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what that does is for every one person who quote wins the grant, the other 99% have learned helplessness. Abroad, this is the NGO industrial complex, which basically wants pets in all of these countries. They want, you know, that money is not sufficient to, right. um, to do anything other than create dependency. And that's what it does. Uh, and then it allows these people to feel like, you know, that they did some good or whatever, but it crowds out local investment and what have you. It doesn't generate any productive capacity, right? This is why Easterly and Levine have written about, like, stop the aid and, and so on and so forth. You talk to, right. you know, folks about this, right? Now, the alternative to this is investment, okay? In investment, you have the same queue of 100 people competing for the investment. But now you have, like, you know, the in tech, there's, like, the Insta brag, right? I did board mm -hmm. in this and you know, like stand for that, or I, you know, founded a company and sold it for X, blah, blah. It's like a one line bio that is the opposite of the woke, you know, self abnegation. This is mm -hmm. all my accomplishments in like one compact sentence. It's like the inst intro, right? And now you have these hundred people who are competing for an investment. And it's like hundred people running, you know, 400 meters around the track. One person might win, but the other 99 get a workout in the process. Okay, you might not want 100 people running around at 400 meters. You know what I'm saying? 100 people running at right. marathon. You know what I'm saying? So even if the 99 don't win, they get a workout. The strengthening, the self-strengthening process that goes into competing for that investment, those folks are just pushing to close one more deal, right? Now, sometimes that can be fake until you make it, but sometimes that can actually be make it. Net, net, mm -hmm. it's, learned, um, uh, it's learned resilience, right? Right. It is learned resourcefulness as opposed to learn helplessness. Okay, and so with that, are we also getting to a world though too where it's like merely to say, "Oh well, I, I you know, I have a BA from Stanford." It's like no so, one cares about that. Exactly right. So yeah. that's, that's I mean, that's like saying I was saved. You know, I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Absolutely. In 1977, but what have you done? Exactly. That's right. So those right. credentials. I mean, I, I I think that college credentials were more of a signal 20 something years ago. And nowadays, you know, I, I don't hire from Harvard or Stanford. I hire from Twitter. I hire from GitHub. Mm -hmm. Like literally mm -hmm. you're looking for someone's portfolio, either their content as a writer, as a tweeter, or their code on GitHub or their designs on Dribbble. Your portfolio is your resume. And that allows yeah. people from, uh, from around the world, you know, the Middle East or the Midwest, right? Inside the US, outside the US, you might not have a name brand, but you've got a really legit portfolio and you're smart in social media. 
that's absolutely somebody who you'd interview and hire. And that's a good chunk of all the folks that we hire now. In fact, being at an expensive college, it's sort of going back to what it used to be, which is like a gentleman's finishing school, right? Right. It's like, yeah, a, yeah. you know, it's, it's not something that's actually, you know, pushing people on technical education. It's like, you know, the, it's the most privileged people who are just having this useless right. kind of thing, right? Time wasting. Um, so, uh, so my point on all this is charity weakens, investment strengthens. And an interesting thing is the folks who are sort of attacking charity, you know, the folks who, who, who yelled at Zuck for building that hospital in San Francisco, right? In a weird way, they're actually, you know, they think that by doing that, they're arguing for total state control over all billionaire fortunes, et cetera, et cetera. What's actually happening is those billionaires are like, you know what? I actually get a lot less flack for making an investment in a biotech company than I do for a nonprofit donation to a hospital. So guess what? They're actually investing now in scalable things, right? Because you can argue that that biotech may actually benefit more people globally than one hospital. Or you invest in a hospital chain, you, you start doing investment rather than charity. My point in this is, A, when you think about ascending class versus descending class, a lot of the folks who call quote tech rich are really born rich people attacking the built rich, number one. So it's interesting. B, what we we do is we invest in people, right? That's what we do. We are trying to level you up, you know? We're trying to give you tools and so on and so forth. C is, you know, with, with the internet, you have like this incredible equality of opportunity, this global opportunity. The world really is your oyster. If you're in a first world country, quote unquote, and, you know, I now call them not first world or developed world, but, you know, ascending world, descending world. If you are, let's say, if you've got a laptop and you've got a quiet room and you're not in the middle of civil war or riots or something like that, you have you have unlimited opportunity in front of you if you hit the right keys in the keyboard. OK, mm-hmm. now. I think that's good overall net net. I think that's good. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, does that mean that every single person is going to come out ahead of where they were before? No, I can't. Uh, but do I think we could have something which is broadly win win for individuals and society at large, I think we could. We just have to get into that mentality of self-strengthening and resilience and investing in each other as opposed to tearing each other down and trying to say that everybody who's coming up is taking something from us and so on and so forth. That's how I think about it. So are you, uh, you know, I just want to uh, slightly point out, so Peter Thiel is actually part of the descending class. That's what I take out of what you're talking about. That he, well, it's interesting. You know, He's So he obviously as a, well, okay, it's complicated, right? Um, yeah. I mean, that might explain why some of his political bets these days seem to be in kind of controlling things rather than growing. Things. Well, it's 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 complicated. Um, you know, look, Peter's, a, you know, an old friend and collaborator and investor and so on and things. OK, um, I think, first of all, he is absolutely built rich as opposed to born rich. So in that sense, sure. you know, he's you know, yeah. pure merit in that sense. Um, I think. He looks at it as uh, his responsibility because, you know, he immigrated to the U.S. and so on. He looks at it as a responsibility to turn around the ship. OK, that's that's what he thinks he's doing. And um, I understand where that comes from. And I, and I understand different people have different views of how, where the ship is going and how to turn around and so on. But I think ultimately it comes from a good place of the America that he admired that could put a man on the moon. He wants to build a country that's capable of doing that. OK. One may agree or disagree with his methods, but I think that's where he's coming from. Um, and others may want, you know, the America of the 50s. You know, Paul Krugman actually likes the America of the 50s. He's like, it was very, very equal much socially. So. Yeah. It had 97% mm-hmm. tax rates. Other people idealize it for different reasons. Yeah. Whereas an alternative view is um, that was great, just like the UK was great, just like Rome was great, just like other empires were great. And you know what? There may be some turnaround that is possible. I cannot fully discount that. But I also see all this stuff happening both internationally and subnationally. I see all these other things. And I think, you know, it's probably unlikely that we're going to put together something that looks exactly like what we were born with. Just like, for example, you know, the 20th century did not look like the 1800s of kings and queens. It looked completely different, right? And what does that look like if we were building it from scratch? You know, you would not have, um, I mean, just for example, anything you're building from scratch today, you're, you're building it off of a laptop, you're building it with code. The way that laws are put together, just as one example, a thousand page bill that's written at the last minute and someone slips in an amendment and that's pushed to 300 million people across the entire country. Anybody who's written any code of any, and then it's tested in production, okay? Anybody who's written right. any code of any kind 
thinks that's insane. If you have a million person web service, you test the hack, you have small bits of code, you push them out one at a time, you test whether it works, you gather feedback, and then you have a re reversion otherwise, and you do that, right? That's like just one small example of how totally obsolete in many ways, the legislating, the operating system and so on is within the US. And so therefore trying to kind of turn that into something that is gonna work, maybe it's possible, you know, good luck to everybody who's trying. Yeah. But I think we should also try to build from scratch and that's what the network state is about. Um, I guess as a, uh, well, let me ask you about the, you know, kind of that mindset of leveling people up and of actualizing you are in Washington uh, to accept, or you were in Washington to accept the Competitive Enterprise Institute's Julian Simon Award. And Julian yes. Simon was in the uh, mid 90s, was dubbed the Doom Slayer by Wired Magazine <laughs> because he believed in kind of humans as literally the ultimate resource and in a world which was ever expanding and ever growing. And, and you, you know, that could just uh, go ad infinitum. Um, do you think we are in short supply of an abundance mindset? And um, how do we get more people oriented around the idea, not of zero sum or that everything in our lives is degrading, but rather, no, this is, we can make more stuff with fewer inputs and everybody can be better off. Yeah, so the way I think about that is, um, you know, you can have, again, a V3, right? There's the sort of naive optimist, right? And they are attacked by the cynical pessimist. And I would actually, at least personally, I've never called myself an optimist or a pessimist. I, I call myself a pragmatist or somebody who knows how much one individual can do. I, abundance doesn't just come out of nowhere. The, the, right. the Superabundance book is a good book because it showed us, shows it is possible, right? But you will need entrepreneurs. You will need investors. You will need mm -hmm. engineers. You'll need people to actually build that future. Right. And uh, that future- Which I might point out is the brilliant- point, I think, at the end of Peter Thiel's Zero to One, right. is that the You're future not does not just happen. Yes. It has, it's happened by specific people trying specific things, so, not just waiting for to it. To talk, talk about that just for a second, basically, that's really the great man theory of history, right? You know, mm -hmm. like one person can make a difference. Standing against this is the concept that, you know, it's the tides of history. We're all carried beyond yeah. it. And I've actually come up with, I think, a synthesis of those two views, which is the tech tree model of history. Mm -hmm. Have you ever played the game Civilization? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's a tech tree and you can decide mm -hmm. to explore this branch or explore that branch, mm -hmm. right? So in the tech tree model, there is all that is known. Okay. All that is discovered. And then you as an engineer can branch over here or found over there. And what Satoshi did is he took a branch and he pushed it out and he really was a quote great man because there's nobody else there was wasn't even a Leibniz right. to his Newton, right? As great as Newton is, there was a Leibniz, you know, another person invented calculus roughly contemporaneously. Right. But Satoshi was really there was nobody else who's kind of doing the same thing. You know, it took five years before mm -hmm. Ethereum and, and whatnot, right? And um so that's something which reconciles the two views. There I mean look one person is not going to be able to rebuild technological civilization from scratch as per that C Rob's right. email that we mentioned. Nevertheless, yep. one person can push the tech tree in a very important direction. And then you can generalize the tech tree concept to the political tree or what have you. You're not going to be able to say rewrite everybody's software from scratch, but you might be able to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so the, the abundance mentality, the Julian Simon mentality is, um, I, I think you can overcorrect into it to just say everything, you know, like be a Pollyanna and things, everything is just mm -hmm. going to keep getting better or whatever. But I think the better version of it is it is possible to make things better. It's, in our, it's our responsibility to do so. All right. I think we're going to leave it there. Apology. Thank you so much for talking to Reza. And congratulations on the Julian Simon Award. Thank you. Thank you.